We are live. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Well, it's at least morning here where I am. I'm not sure where you guys are, but let me know in the chat uh, where you're tuning in from, whether it's morning, evening, or night. And sip on my coffee. I'm super excited, guys. We have another amazing uh, workshop here with SLP Foundation. Uh, we have Joey and JT with us. This is the first time we're having uh, two presenters. So we had a bit of technical difficulties. I thank you guys for uh, sticking in and hanging out with us. Uh, but we're here. We're ready to go. Um, and so I want to ask Joey and JT a couple questions before we dive into, um, into the workshop. Um, I know JT, uh, Joey is uh, part of um, the SLP Foundation for a while. And um, I want to know... Um, how you guys came into working um, working with BCH and working on SLP specifically? So I've been I've been in uh, I've been in Bitcoin Cash for a long time. I started up actually really like uh, I mean I go all the way back to before the Bitcoin Cash forward. So that's like sort of two hundred one four time or something two hundred one four time or something like that. And I actually started out. It wasn't really into crypto. I started out actually just doing. I was originally an e-commerce merchant like a long time ago. Um, I ran I had my payments cut by PayPal, and that's when I discovered Bitcoin and I realized this transformational technology of like borderless cash and borderless payments. Um, and then that's how I got into Bitcoin and I started doing meetups. And there's like a long chain of events that led me to SLP, led me to sort of creating projects on Bitcoin Cash, and then around November last year, you know, me and me and JT and a few other people, we, you know, really wanted to set up this idea of uh, a foundation that basically supports this blooming ecosystem that's growing on on Bitcoin Cash, right? Because we started realizing, hey, this token, this token thing is a huge driver a driver of, of adoption, and it's like gonna explode and it's exploding. So we really just wanted to make sure that that scales, and that was like. The idea, we talked to loads of businesses and we were like, hey, you you happy to invest to chip in the SLP foundation and worked with a bunch of sort of big, I guess, BCH big wigs. And then we created this foundation and uh, ever since we've been working on a bunch of stuff like infrastructure, like promotion, like research and development, like enhancing you know, what we already have. Uh, yeah, so that's basically, and I, I've, you know, I've created like a few tokens and stuff like that. So that's like my story, I guess. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I also like you know did a did a little research and I saw that you are into biohacking. Now this is something that I only recently kind of found out about in the last year or so. But um, do you um, want to talk a bit about biohacking? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm surprised. You, I'm surprised the first time you heard of it because I imagine in, it's actually really big in North America, right? Biohacking is bigger. I would say in North America than, you know, the, the rest of the world. Like, there's a real movement going on there in terms of people just optimizing their health. And, like, you know, it, it, it's, it's a wide spectrum. You can go all the way from, like, peak optimization, which is, like, people just optimizing their health. That's, like, intermittent fasting. You can go all the way to CRISPR, which is, like, people injecting, you know, stuff into themselves to change their DNA, right? So it's a really, like, it goes all the way from, you know, being an eye herb to you know, people like trying to like hack, cure things like COVID nineteen in their labs, which they're actually doing. There's actually a movement right now that people are trying to find a uh, vaccine, you know, using DIY by bio, you know bioengineering. I'm not not sure if you're aware of CRISPR technology. That's a uh, very recent, only in the past few years. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's on Netflix and everything. And it's I think it's up it's up there with crypto. It's up there like with AI. It's like gonna be. Like I think in the next ten or twenty years, you're gonna see this huge explosion of like biohacking technology, and maybe it'll start off just serving the rich. I don't know. You're looking at some of these really new therapies, like the one Trump is taking, like mono, monoclonal body uh, therapy. Um, a lot of biologics are very expensive to produce. So, any one of the key things that the biohacking is worried about, the biohacking world is worried about, is what if all these technologies are just restricted for rich people, right? You have all these like regenerative technologies that are coming into play, like tissue replacement. You know, people will be able to replace nerve tissue, be able to replace heart tissue and stuff like that. And they might only be available for very rich people. So hopefully the idea is that 
you know, that will, the cost will come down. But uh, that industry, I believe, especially with the demographics, you know, the aging baby boomers and, you know, uh, it's just going to be, I think it's going to explode. Like it's up there with cryptocurrency, up there with AI, up there with self-driving cars, up there with machine learning. Um, I, I think I think so, yeah. So I'm very passionate about that. Like that's, that's something that I, yeah, w did work in for a while, yeah. That's amazing. Here we are like right on the, the cutting edge of like all these different kind of industries by like all the things that you mentioned. And like, I find, I feel like some way they're all going to kind of converge and I'm super excited to see how it all plays out. Um, yeah, you mentioned CRISPR technology. That was kind of like, like I, I saw a documentary recently and that's what like dove me down the hole. Like I, I like yeah. I know about intermittent fasting and those types of things, but like actually being able to DIY affect your DNA, it's, it's baffling. It's in cra it's crazy. We're in a sci-fi world. Um, and yeah, we're, we're just mm. building here. We're building our own thing in blockchain space, but there's tons of stuff that are, that are happening around us and, and will definitely inevitably, uh, converge. All right. So I think we're going to jump into the, uh, workshop now, but before we jump into that, I want to uh, remind all the folks that are tuning in to, um, if you have a question during the the workshop, please drop it into the ask a question slot there. And if you see a question already there that you're, you want answered, make sure you give that an upvote and I will jump in and ask these guys for you um, and we'll make sure that you get your question answered. And right beside the ask a question, you'll see a polls uh, button. We've got a few polls. Uh, put out already. Let's see what kind of answers we've got. So I've asked people, um, do you have any experience with MongoDB? We have a resounding 80% of folks saying no. So maybe you're going to learn a little bit about that today. Um, have you ever made uh, your own token before? It's a 50-50 split. I love seeing those 50-50 splits. We have folks that are like, you know, deep technical, um, already hacking on their own tokens and some people that have never dabbled. So this is the perfect opportunity uh, during this hackathon to get your uh, first token created. And um, very interesting question here. We have how many hackathons have you been a part of before? So um, surprisingly, 50% uh, have been to at least two or up to five hackathons and 33% have been to five or more hackathons. That's great and amazing to see. I love, um, you know, bringing old heads as well as new heads into the space. So we have 16% uh, of folks are saying this is their first time. So I'd like to see that number increase as well. But I'm, I'm really glad to see that uh, there's a bunch of us that uh, are veterans in the hackathon space. So that's super exciting. Okay, so um, is there anything I, I need to mention here? Yeah, so we mentioned the polls and we mentioned the ask a question. So I'm going to shut up now, make myself scarce, and I'm going to introduce to the live stream Joey. He is a director of the SLP Foundation, a co founder of Spice Token, and the creator also of Spice Feed which is uh, like a, like a Twitter-like social network. Very interesting. We can ask him about that later. Um, he's currently working on an SLP-based game. And during the course of Block Hack, he's got a very exciting announcement to, to make. So stay tuned um, and listen intently for that. And uh, he's also, of course, one of the mentors for um, all you folks that are building on SLP. Um, so if you need any help, you can definitely find him in the Discord chat. I'd also like to welcome to the stream JT. Um, you might notice a little digitized face there. That's JT. Mm -hmm. He is uh, our anonymous, super amazing developer that is also a mentor for SLP, so you can find him in the chats. Um, he's a lead dev at SLP, and he's also a co-founder of uh, fountainahead.cash, which is uh, a suite of developer services. So I'd like you all to give a nice digital hand clap and welcome to JT and Joey. Uh, welcome to the stream, guys. I'm going to make myself uh, smile. Hey, everyone. Boop. So your screen is now casting, my friend. OK, cool. So yeah. I guess uh, we can start. I mean, this is the presentation. Um, right. So the first thing, oh, how do I click? Oh, 
Yeah, so the first thing I want to do is uh, I think the, the most important thing of SLP is like the most useful tool for doing SLP is like Electron Cache SLP edition. So I would say to all folks right now, you know, just if you, you're interested in developing, just go and download that because that is gonna that is gonna make everything so much easier. So you go onto this website, uh, simple ledger.cache. Uh, project Electron Cache SLP Edition, and um, yeah, just download download the one um, you want. You know, whichever you know. If you're like a hardcore developer, I guess you'll be using like Linux, right? But I use Mac OS because I'm not like that hardcore. And then I guess some people use Windows, like probably like a lot of people. But uh, let's not go into Windows there. Um, and um, yeah, so so you download this, and then what I would like everyone to do is that I'm just going to open my electron cache. What I want everyone to do is just uh, put in your, put in your uh, simple ledger ad addresses on um, the chat. You get it. So you can do this while you know, I'm running the workshop. And uh, I'm just going to let this out. My computer is slow. So maybe all this shit that I've opened. Oh, I swore. Sorry. <laughs> Turn on, turn on, turn on. Hmm? Okay, anyway, so you can install this. It should be pretty straightforward uh, to how to get your, where your simple ledger, you just set it up, set up, set up the wallet. It'll ask you for a seed and basically, um, ask you for a seed and basically, once you create your wallet, um, you will, uh, no, not ask you for a seed, so I'll give you a seed. And once you create your wallet, it will basically okay. Here we go. It's gonna go. Oh, because it's like a different window, right? Let me just put this. Yeah, so once you create your wallet, let's uh create your wallet and then it'll basically give you your seed, write your seed down. Pretty straightforward process. So I'm not gonna run through that. And then you wanna go to receive, right? And you wanna get this address. And I want you to paste it into the chat on uh, the Crowdcast chat. So I'm just going to let you guys do this. I'm not going to obviously wait for you guys to do that. So I'm going to carry on with uh, introducing SLP. Uh, but that would be, if you guys had a few address addresses on that, that would be a kind of fun thing we can do later um, or show you know, uh, a pretty cool aspect, a pretty cool feature of SLP. Um, so. So SLP token is a system built on top of uh, Bitcoin Cash. Uh, Bitcoin Cash is a leading cryptocurrency of high market liquidity and wide adoption uh, networks. Uh, you know, because people would people might kind of ask, right? Like, why why build on Bitcoin Cash? Like, why why you know so many blockchains, so many cryptocurrencies out there? Uh, like, why build on Bitcoin Cash, right? So, you know, I'm just gonna go through like some points. I'm go through these really quickly because I don't want to spend a long time on you know. Bitcoin Cash. Um, so wallet, in terms of wallet adoption, like we have massive wallet adoption in Bitcoin Cash. Bitcoin Cash is in most uh, major cryptocurrency wallets. You know, you talk about BitPay, talking about blockchain, you're talking about like, you know, probably any, almost any um, cryptocurrency wallet will have Bitcoin Cash um, added to it. Um, there aren't many that won't have it. Uh, you know, I just wanted to put a stat there, like Bitcoin.com alone apparently has 300K installs. So if you're looking to build an app, like an SLP app, and Bitcoin.com supports SLP, uh, Bitcoin.com wallet supports SLP, then basically automatically your token's gonna, you know, you, your token can go on that app. Like 300 user installs can run that token. Wide merchant adoption on BitPay, on Purse, Coin Payments, and more. Uh, low fees. This is really key for the Bitcoin Cash um, uh, sort of selling point. Uh, so because of the low fee and the speed we can do transactions very rapidly and we can do a lot of them very quickly and very cheaply. And that's going to be a key to a lot of SLP functionality we talk about later, right? Like how do we abuse, abuse the minting baton uh, to basically, you know, create all these like innovative ways of, you know, getting a lot of, like a lot of SLP transactions going, you know, without having to do like uh, batching them in a smart contract, right? Um, it's fast, you know, it's super, it's going to be even faster with, uh, the new, uh, double proof, uh, double spend proof. So it's already very fast with zero comp, but, um, with the new, the upgrades coming, 
it's going to be faster. It's a top cryptocurrency, which is like, I think it's on coin market cap like number five. So it's got a lot of liquidity, right? It's literally like up there in terms of up there with like Ethereum, you know, Bitcoin, Ripple, and so on. Uh, proof of work, uh, like we believe that's a, like a big selling point. You know, I mean, it's fair coin distribution. We have lots of pools, tons and tons of miners like securing it. it you know, and, and it's more decentralized than proof of stake because proof of stake has a few people which have de facto control over the entire cryptocurrency, right? So the great thing about proof of work is that you can only get the coins by mining, right? So there's no, there's no pre-mine of any sort. There's no thing where 50% of the coin, coin volume, you know, coin um, dis distribution be belongs to like the founding team. Uh, we have no, we have no money going to the founding team, like in terms of from the Coinbase rewards. So it's, it's probably like the most decentralized uh, cryptocurrency out there, or one of the most. I mean, we're pretty proud of the, you know, we're pretty proud to be a cryptocurrency that is fully decentralized from a governance sense and only want to be really, really focused on global adoption. So that's bringing blockchain technology to the whole world and not just, you know, not just like the financial hubs or not just the first world, right? So we're literally talking about like, you know, anywhere, everywhere, you know, Africa, you know, Philippines and these places that don't have banking. So that's pretty important to Bitcoin Cash. Um, it's highly scalable, so uh, 32 megabyte capacity, we're 32 times the capacity of Bitcoin Core. Uh, obviously, Bitcoin Core is SegWit, so that does increase the capacity a little bit. But in terms of the raw amount of transactions that Bitcoin Cash can uh, process is like much in an order of much higher magnitude to the point that, you know, we actually, there's so much space before we hit that 32 cap that basically like the, the potential for growth is just like um, almost like, well, I guess from this standpoint, almost like limitless. Uh, there's, um, we, we had an upgrade on Bitcoin Cash that differentiates us from uh, Bitcoin Core, like BTC, uh, by having the check data say, we basically can do oracles and we can do like other applications that are uh, using smart contracts that we basically can't do uh, on Bitcoin Core. Um, so, just want to go through some, um, you know, some key features of SLP. So, you know, why build on SLP, right? Like, there's so many token solutions out there. Like, I mean, there's like Tezos, there's ERC, there's Polkadot, there's you know, all these like other token solutions. So, why, why build? You know, I already talked about why Bitcoin Cash is very secure and a great blockchain to build on, right? So, why use SLP? And the answer to that is I say lightweight, it's plug and play, and it's low barrier of entry. So what I mean by that, it's lightweight because it's super, super cheap, and it's super fast to send multiple transactions uh, with very little effort. So that's like lightweight. It's also lightweight in terms of software. You don't need to run a lot of different things to basically uh, develop or run SLP applications. It's plug and play. So we can literally mint a token with a few clicks. Like it is like that easy. But at the same time, not only can we get a token in a few clicks, which actually some of these competitors or alternatives can do, we can also like easily incorporate like more advanced functionalities like smart smart contracts and programmability and you know uh, you know minting schedules and all this kind of stuff uh, with fast NFTs. That's going to be a big one. Um, low barrier of entry. You know, this is uh, you don't need to learn Solidity. You don't need to learn a new language. You don't need to learn how to do smart contracts. Actually, like to make a token on ERC on Ethereum, you need to learn how to do a smart contract to set it up to distribute to a lot of people. You need to learn how to write that in Solidity, and then you know you have to plug in, and then you know it's um, so so with uh, SLP, you actually just need basic JavaScript, web dev skills. And then you can get started. Like it's like that easy. You just need the typical mean full stack type knowledge straight from a boot camp, and you can go right in there. So very low barrier of entry. And then the fact that Bitcoin Cash and SLP is so fast also means that when you build these apps, you can test your actual transactions on mainnet uh, very rapidly. And you can do it on test net if you want, but you know, if you do it on mainnet, it's gonna cost you next to nothing because uh, you know the fees are extremely, extremely cheap. Um, so how easy it is? Well, let's mint a token right now. Uh, there are two ways of doing it. So one way to do it is to um, go to um, mint.bitcoin.com. So it's a website. 
I'm still on the stream, right? I'm still on the stream, right? Uh, okay. You are, you are really, live. You're definitely live. I can't see my face on the screen, so I'm like, I'm not sure. Uh, it's all good. We we got you. We, we see your screen and we see okay, you so, in a small square, yeah. Awesome, awesome. So, so mint.bitcoin.com is really cool. I won't this I, I I will use this, but uh, because if I use this, I have to create a new wallet. And basically, you create a new wallet, and it will like prompt you. And it's a really easy way to make a new token. You can actually uh, just create your new token uh, here, very easy, a few clicks. And then you can even like use this tool here to like upload your icon. So you can get your icon up there, and it'll be displayed very very quickly. Um, I highly recommend this tool. Uh, if you want to like create your own token, very very easy to use. Like again, if you want to create a token once you have a wallet. Like this is it. Just create a wallet. You just basically type a few things and you're done. But uh, we're not going to use this tool. We're going to use Electron Cash because that's even easier to create a token. And um, let me just hide this. You know, so none of my passwords come out, right? <laughs> um, so. Yeah, so basically here you go to tokens, and uh, you see here we actually created a DevCon Liberty dollar. So we created this token as an example in the last hackathon we did, a very simple example. But let's create a block hack run, okay? So let's create token name block hack 2020. Joey, are you able to make it bigger at all for us? Is uh, that no, really. is, it, is it really tiny? I mean, it's it's uh, it's not the worst, but if you could make it bigger in any way, that'd be cool. But yeah. Let me try. I think there's a way of like making everything magnified. Do you think I'm talking too fast? Should I slow no. down a little bit? Okay. Okay, cool. So I think I sort of go faster the more I talk. No, I think you're doing uh, well. Uh, if anybody has any questions up to this point, please let us know in the ask a question slot. Um, and yeah, we'll, I'll, I'll make sure to shout it out. And um, yeah, Joey's, Joey's okay with us jumping in at any point in time. So yeah, if you have any questions, please let us know. Okay. I hope that doesn't crash the computer. Did it go black? Because it's no. I think. Uh, yeah, you see that? Okay. Is that are better? you are you moving your mouse at all? I am. Yeah, I think it might have uh, it might have froze. Oh no, I think it's just adjusting. And now, yeah, it did zoom in a bit for us. Okay. Right. Can you see that window better? Because I think that's as much as I can do. Before yeah. It yeah. Going. That's definitely better than it was, yeah. Thank you so much. OK. So um, ticker symbol, I guess let's just go for BL. BLK. OK, let's go for BLK. BLK, what, the, what do you think we should go with, Jordan? BLK, ticker, ticker symbol. Um, hmm. can, we, can we do one, yeah, for, for uh, BH? BHG, Block Hack Global, 2020, or? 2020, okay, let's do that. So URL hacks, this is actually when we come to, when we talk about NFTs, we can actually use these fields to put a lot of uh, metadata in there. Uh, but at the moment, I mean, if you wanted to, you could put your white paper here, you could put sort of any data you want. I'll set the decimal places to eight, and then I will have the token quantity as one million, okay. Two, three, four, five, six. I have that as fixed supply, um, and then actually, let's make it ten million, right? So more to give. <laughs> um, yeah, so you can actually like so if you don't press fixed supply, then basically you get something called a minting baton, which allows you to create as many tokens as you want afterwards, right? But we'll go for simplicity. sake, we'll go for a fixed supply. NFT is obviously if you want to create a game item, like the fungible token, and then I will just go ahead and create that token. All right. All right, so there we go. There is our token. Uh, I see block hack 2020. Um, I can view the token information right here. 
And then, yeah, so you can see here the token. This is the genesis uh, of the actually. So, you know, without using a smart, con smart contract, we've already basically created a uh, new token. And this token I can use to send to anyone right now immediately. I can use to airdrop. I can use to do all sorts of things with the token already, right? So uh, imagine if you're like uh, de developing an app that just saves so much time and effort in terms of um, other stuff. So, you know, let's plug this in into the Explorer, right? And then if I put that in the Explorer, let's see. Mm -hmm. Thought I copied and paste that. Okay, so you see a token. There you go. It's there. Yeah. Created the minting baton is dead ended and so on. So this is it. So this is the token. And then if we start sending stuff, stuff will appear in a transaction, you know, chart and history. And then there's like all sorts of tools you can use to dive in. Uh, you can upload an icon, which I'm not going to do for this because it will take more time. Um, so yeah, that's how easy it is. And you know, you can use uh, Electron Cash. You can use Mint, uh, .bitcoin.com here if you want a more beautiful um, UI. That's also like another tool to quickly mint your token. So I've just demonstrated that you can mint a token in a, in a few clicks. Right, so let's carry on. Um, went to the block hack token. So talk about the existing SLP um, ecosystem. So actually SLP has been going on for you know, more than two years now. Um, and we have like an ecosystem of stuff. Um, we have a tipping token. So that's like mint, sour. We have social media spice. So spice is Basically, uh, the token I created, my co-founder of Spice, I'm going to sort of demonstrate that a little bit in a bit. Uh, we have stable coins. So, uh, so yeah, we actually have USDT on, um, on SLP. So if you go to sideship.ai, you can basically use, say if you wanted to use Ethereum and you wanted to buy, you know, USDT, T, USDT on SLP, which is called PCH here, it's the same thing then you can actually do that. So that's been kind of growing because all these stable coins are huge. Um, there are games coming out. You know, Orb token is an Orb game. We have uh, exchange tokens. Coinflex is a exchange that's, um, you know, they're using the exchange token. The exchange token is using Yeah, so they're a physically delivered crypto uh, futures exchange, and they're using SLP, basically, to do their exchange tokens. There are quite a few other exchanges and other things I've heard about. That This is, this is not an exhaustive list of all SLP um, projects. I just listed you know, a few that I know of. There's HoneyPay. So HoneyPay is a reward scheme where if you spend money, basically, it's like air miles, right? So the SLP tokens are rewarded back to if you buy like a coffee, if you buy like a plane ticket, you basically get these reward points to the amount you spent, and then you can use the pay points to uh, redeem other stuff, right? Uh, there's also a hardware hardware wallet coming. This is Satoshi uh, Satoshi Satoshi chip, and uh, that's just recently uh, added SLP. So uh, that should be I think that's already come out uh, or is coming out soon. And that will basically be a hardware wallet to be able to store all um, SLP uh, tokens. So yeah, my project, I'll show you my project Spice. So Spice is an appreciation token that I co-founded last year. I'm no longer, I'm like an advisor to it right now, but I worked on it for a year. Um, it's an appreciation token that uh, integrates and ranks social media content, right? So we, we have a sort of a budding ecosystem. We're like games. We have like a bunch of stuff going on there. You know, there's a bunch, we have like, yeah, I don't know if these arrows work. We're on a bunch of different exchanges, um, Coinex, Bitcoin.com, CryptoPhil. Um, so yeah, so the way it works is pretty simple. Like for example, I'm on the SLP 
chat right now. So if I say, hey, I like this Jerry comment, right? OK. Um, let me just give him free peppers, OK? <clears throat> yeah. So you see, I've tipped him. I've instantly tipped him, you know, 75 spice, you know, to Jerry. So that's actually the SLP token. Um, and um, yeah, so okay, yeah, here you go. So John Wall is like doing it again, right? Yeah. So you can keep doing this, and then we have all sorts of funny things. So you know, I could actually go, I could actually go. We have like a function called mushroom, right? So mushroom is random. Mushroom is between like zero to one thousand, right? So I don't know what's gonna happen. I'm gonna do it, and then let's see. Uh, what the tip will be. Okay. Oh no, I tipped the wrong one. Whoops, sorry. I tipped the actual. So let's tip this one. Huh, that's weird. It's not registering. Anyways, um, yeah, the mushroom thing should work, but I don't know why it's not working. Maybe the command was changed. But so basically what I built is I built this social media feed called Spice Feed. So if I clicked on that link just now, it actually shows me, right? I've got uh, three peppers to Jerry on Simple Ledger Protocol. And we can actually click, we can actually click like this, the Simple Ledger Protocol group. Uh, this is the app I built. And you can see all the tips, all the posts that's been for Tip Spice on the you know Simple app, uh, Ledger uh, TG channel, right? So no. If I press media on, it um, yeah, it just shows you the stuff with media. So it's just I, I hope this doesn't load anything like NS. Oh, so cool, right? Like you can see the a uh, block hack there. It's like block hack stuff. Just people posting SLP stuff. That's my game, by the way. <laughs> so yeah, you can see like various things. You can go to uh, top group so we can you can see who's tipping the most there's like a leaderboard leaderboard you go to top group um and it shows you basically all the tele we have like hundreds of telegram groups basically using a uh, spice bar uh so so yeah this shows all the groups you can click, click onto the groups and yeah it goes to the groups right so you can see i don't i mean this is a is this a spanish group so this is like spanish right um, yeah, so this is something we built. We have a bunch of other stuff um, on the ecosystem. But I just wanted to show you guys an example of like one of these um, SLP projects. Um, so that's Spice that I just demonstrated to you. Um, there's also Mint. Mint is great. Mint is a very up and coming tipping token. Um, and it works exactly the same way as I showed shown you. Only with that, you can add any token you want to Mint. So I do think you know you're interested in that. Check check mint out. Check spice out. You know check all these out. Um, so let's move on. So you know we have a we have an ecosystem that's um, kind of coming along. And what's uh, why is this not that? okay? So yeah, what are what's, what what else is attractive about SLP? You know simplicity of use, very simple to use. Like I said earlier, you know the the great thing about SLP is that it's not just a like a like a like a really dumb solution, dumb token, right? It's not a dumb te technology. Like, you can actually program it with smart contracts. It's just that a lot of projects don't actually need smart contract capability. But if you wanted to um, program it with, say, you know, uh, make, make your token mineable, you can actually do that. You can actually use smart contracts. Very low fees, that's a huge selling point. You know, con considering the congestion currently with, like, the Ethereum blockchain, you know, people are trading game items and they're paying like, you know, seven, eight USD to like trade a game item or trade an NFT items, right? So with low fees, not only can you trade for like almost next to nothing, we can also do like say 25 like transactions like together, like batch together um, with, the, with a very low fee. So we can rapidly do a lot of these, which allows us to have a lot more interesting uses of the, of the SLP protocol. Um, so these are just very simple ones. What are crypto tokens? And you know, I'll just let you read this. Using the architecture, use, users can create tokens where they, they want to represent some kind of real world asset. Like government currency provides some specific kind of utility to users, like access to their online software service. Why tokens? Transparent, simple, and secure. They eliminate the possibility of double counting and fraudulent manipulating in an accounting system. 
permissionless and censorship resistant. Um, and you know, we, at SLP Foundation, we actually believe too that tokenization is actually a great way to drive adoption for projects. Like, you know, you've seen projects that you know don't use tokens, and you see projects that do use tokens, right? And projects that do use tokens often gain a lot of traction because the token itself is actually a kind of selling point where people put money into the tokens wanting that project to succeed, right? So tokens is actually like almost a way of fundraising. And that's worked out very well for Ethereum, worked out for a lot of projects. And, you know, that's why I think tokenization is very, very important. And, you know, any project that is building on blockchain should, you know, seriously consider whether they have a model to tokenize. That doesn't mean all projects are suitable for tokenization, but I would say a lot of projects, you know, have some option of, you know, tokenizing it to basically take advantage of this huge, um, you know, change in how finance is working. And eventually that will move into like security tokens, they'll move into other things and tokens will represent real estate that represent legal contracts or represent collectible items. And so this is just, you know, it's just going to, like, in, in my opinion, and in the SLP Foundation's opinion, it's just going to just gonna totally, like, explode exponentially at some point. Uh, why SLP? You know, I already stated that. No smart contract programming required. You know, some SLP wallets just allow you to mint and burn tokens, like I showed you on Electron Cash, you know, affordable you know, cheap. Um, so possible use cases, let's go on to that. Um, you know, that's, uh, you, so I just noticed the graphic. <laughs> Common possible use cases, you know, you can use SLP tokens for voting and polling. We did that at the DEF CON, the last hackathon we did, we actually used SLP tokens to vote for the projects we like the best. Uh, we might be able to do that again, we might do that again. Um, access control and event ticketing. So this is a thing where we can actually use an NFT token or tokens to basically use them as like an access token. So imagine if you had a, a token in your phone that you can use to unlock your house, unlock your car. So that's the kind of token we're talking about. Right? We're in the future, if you had car keys and your wife or your girlfriend is away and you wanted to, you know, give the cars over, you can just do that over blockchain. You can transfer that, you know, uh, James Kramer has a project called Token Off and he's really working on this. And basically that's gonna, you know, you're gonna be able to just transfer access of property right across to someone else's phone, right? So you wouldn't have to, you know, drive over to her to hand over your car keys. Um, event ticketing, decentralized cryptocurrency. So, you know, that's like Tether is a great example, a stable coin, you know, that's a cryptocurrency. That's actually another cryptocurrency, but it's riding on the SLP system, right? And then riding on the Bitcoin Cash. Uh, NFT collectible games, that's going to be massive. Gaming is a gigantic, gigantic industry. You know, I feel like personally, I'm working on a game, and I really believe like the closest thing to crypto are gamers. Because gamers already understand the, the idea of virtualization. They already understand the idea of virtualization of digital assets. Because They've been playing World of Warcraft, they've been playing all these games that have in-game currencies, right? So the idea of a digital currency or digital items is already so intuitive to them that I feel like that is just like, I feel like that stuff, like CryptoKitties was just like the star. I feel like that stuff is just gonna, it's, it, it's gonna be big. Like, you know, maybe not immediately, but definitely like within a five year frame, uh, frame range, time, time frame. Branded community point system. So this is great. Like, you know, you could use this like, like Spice. Spice is a type of uh, community point system, right? So if you say something I really like or I feel like it's really, your content's really good, I can just send you the token of appreciation, right? And you can see on Spice Feed that, you know, you can see on Spice Feed that people can basically uh, use that to show how much they like your post, right? So if you like their posts a lot, you'll just send you'll just send a lot of a lot of um, the tokens, right? Um, yeah. Where are we? Where are we? Asset backed tokens. Oh, actually, that's actually more. Sorry, Tether was not an example of that. Tether was more of an example of asset backed tokens. So it could be backed by gold. It could be backed by so many kind of real world asset. USD is a kind of asset. I guess decentralized cryptocurrency just means something like Spice or some other cryptocurrency you create that is used to like uh, be a in-game utility token, uh, sorry, no, in-app utility token for your app. 
Uh, rewards distribution, like HoneyPay's, already talked about that, like Air Miles, like spending money and people like getting something back for spending money with merchants. So those are common possible use cases. I'm sure there are even, I've actually seen already projects that even have like cooler applications of SLP. So, you know, those are just the common ones. Um, so how did SLP come about? Um, yeah, I just, I don't really want to spend too much time on this because it's, uh, it's 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 pretty it's pretty short. So during 201A, you know, people are trying to come up with solutions for tokens on Bitcoin Cash, right? And then a bunch of people came together and they sort of like debated a bit about it. And then in the end, you know, people just agreed on simple ledger protocol as the best way forward. This was the simplest, it was non-invasive, it didn't require consensus changes to the blockchain, which is very important because it means that we're not fundamentally changing anything about Bitcoin Cash, right? And you know that just means that we don't need to have as much consensus or anything. We literally can just build the system in parallel. So this ultimately got chosen, you know, James Kramer's uh, Simple Ledger protocol. And then after he sort of built the initial tooling and that got funded, then it just went from there. But uh, yeah, that's basically the history of uh, SLP. Okay, so. Let's talk about like uh, the UTXO model. So I just didn't realize this is animated, so I'm just gonna let this animate. <laughs> Okay, so the UTXO model, unspent transaction outputs, they can be treated as a unit of account that can collectively make up the balance in a user wallet. Um, so the best way, I don't really wanna go into this too much because uh, if you wanna understand a UTXO model well, and the UTXO model is the main model that basically uh, Bitcoin Cash uses to do the blockchain, to do the ledger. And uh, Jerry Kwan's uh, intro to BCH development has covered this in a lot more detail. Like he's done a he's done a fantastic job. So if you really want to understand the ins and outs of how the Bitcoin Cash blockchain works, I recommend recommend uh, like watching his video. Um, so UTXO literally means unspent transaction outputs. Um, so what, what, what do we mean by unspent transaction outputs? To understand that, we need to sort of understand that Bitcoin Cash like operates like a ledger. And the way it operates like a ledger is when you send a mon money from user A to user Z, imagine that you can just always like melt coins to create a new coin and melt them again and then you can re- you can re-divide the coins and then you can like put the coins back together. Like melt, like it, imagine it's like liquid gold, like an analogy. And you can melt the coins, you can split the coins and you can keep doing that. Like different people and then everyone that receives a coin, they can split that in half. And if there's two halves, they can join back together. Um, you know, one output will become one input somewhere. And let me just go to the next one. Okay. Sorry, I just, uh, I didn't realize these are animated, so I wasn't expecting them to be. Um, let's look at simple between two. Okay. So actually, I'm just gonna animate them all. Right, so this is like the, the UTXL model. You know, there's a bunch of inputs and outputs. Um, and SLP works at it, attaching metadata in what is called an op return output in a Bitcoin Cash transaction. This data designates which of the outputs receive tokens. And the UTXO model, um, each time you spend a Bitcoin transaction, you create, each time you spend a Bitcoin transaction, you create a new output. Um, uh, where that designate where the Bitcoin Cash goes and you consume these outputs to create a new transaction. This is why Explorer shows multiple outputs. Like when you do a uh, normal transaction sending, there will be two outputs, one to the person that you're sending and one to the remaining balance. So uh, basically, yeah, so it's like, it actually explains here, like change. And we have to sort of re remind ourselves that all of these inputs on the UTXO model come from outputs, right? 
So what we have is that one BCH output will become a one uh, BCH input somewhere. So it forms like a tree, like a hierarchy that we call the DAG. The DAG is a, you know, it's a sh short term for directed uh, uh, eclipse, sorry, how do you pronounce that? Directed uh, acrylic graph. Um, exactly, sorry, Jerry, what, uh, sorry, uh, JT, what, how do you pronounce that? The DAG, the full DAG name? Yeah, directed acyclic graph. Directed acyclic graph. We call this the DAG because uh, directed because it only moves in one direction. Um, so the graph only moves in one direction, and there's no cycle, so it's acyclic. And uh, that it's also a graph because we're talking about like a like a hierarchy of transaction, right? So this hierarchy, the entire entire history of Bitcoin Cash blockchain basically forms one gigantic DAG, like one gigantic ledger where all the inputs are always connected to the outputs. So all these inputs come from some kind of output. And if an output is unspent, it, if, if there is no output, that transaction is called unspent. So that would be like, say if you have uh, one Bitcoin in your wallet, then that one Bitcoin will actually be called a UTXO, that's unspent. And that's because when it's spent, let's say if you have six BCH, um, no, so let's say you have seven BCH and you basically send six BCH to one person, right? And then that six BCH goes to one address and then one BCH to the change basically goes back to your own address, right? Or someone else's address. Um, and you can also just have one address if you just basically send the entire balance of that SLP address to one address. So if you sort of picture all these inputs and outputs kind of connecting together. You sort of see a tree or a hierarchy that creates like a, you know, globe spanning massive ledger that goes all the way to the first uh, Bitcoin transaction ever made. And every one of these transactions takes a small fee. And that's basically like how it works. Like uh, the miners on the proof of work they mine. Uh, they put hash work into it to secure the blockchain. They get rewarded a bit of the Coinbase, but they also get some of this uh, coin fee. So every time you do one of this, you get a coin fee. So I hope that explains it enough uh, because the UTXO model, I feel like it was better covered in uh, Jerry, Jerry's uh, PTH workshop. So definitely um, head there if uh, you, you wanna know more about how Bitcoin Cash works exactly. So I'm just going to pause this a little bit. I just want to ask if there are any questions from the audience right now, because I have to constantly switch between this and uh, Crowdcast. So, yeah. Do we have any questions yeah, from we, the we, audience? We do have one question here. Um, <clears throat> the question is, are there any drawbacks of NFTs? Are there any drawbacks on NFTs? Mm -hmm. Is that on the, yeah, so... I don't know what, can you be more specific, like in terms of drawbacks? You mean as NFT as a actual idea or NFTs on SLP? Because I feel like that's uh, those are two very different topics. Yeah, I mean, maybe, yeah, to try and maybe put words in this person's mouth, is there like, I, the I, NFT is like for a specific use case. So maybe like you wouldn't necessarily use an NFT as a currency, um, but is there any, I guess, specific instances where an NFT would be beneficial as opposed to another type of token? Oh yeah, definitely. Like in a lot, in a lot of cases, yeah. For example, like NFTs. Okay, so this is the easiest way to think about it. NFTs are basically like um, tokens that cannot be split apart. That's basically what NFT means. It means non-fungible just basically means that you can't break that. Like a USD, you, can't break, you can break that into a cent, but you can't break a stock market share into like more stock market shares, right? Or you can't break, you, you know, you can't break a, a card, like a game weapon or a game armor or a, a achievement into more pieces, right? So the best way to understand NFTs is basically it's at the core, it's just basically crypto kitties, Gods and chain, whatever the app is, at the core, an NFT is basically a token that cannot split apart. And that has a lot of use cases, right? Because a lot of tokens you don't actually want to split up split apart. So you don't want to 
split security tokens apart, you don't want to split your Pikachu into four pieces, right? So um, that would be my answer to that. I feel like the question was perhaps asking about something more, um, like the limitations of NFTs, as in like, like in what scenarios would they be disadvantaged or? Yeah, I'm not sure if uh, maybe the person who posed the question wants to add a, a comment, they can do that or edit the question. Um, but aside from that, is if there's any more questions, we're welcome to take them now. Otherwise, Joey, you're, pl you're, uh, at fr you're free to move on if you'd like. And I'll, I'll let you are know. There any, uh, yeah, I'll let you are know. Are there any people that you. Sorry. Because I know a lot of people with block hacks seem to be, I mean, at least a portion of them seem to be coming from the Ethereum model, right? So. Is there any questions regarding like understanding the UTXO model, like the Bitcoin um, model in terms of how we uh, do transactions from the audience? Um, there's another question here, not related to what you just asked, but actually, no, there's a couple questions coming in. So let me just ask this one here. Um, as, mm -hmm. uh, what is SLP's long-term mandate? Like, what's the goal of SLP? SLP's long-term mandate is, well, SLP Foundation has a bunch of goals. We are doing like a lot of research and developments, development into adding more functionality um, onto SLP. So there's some exciting stuff that we're going to be announcing. Actually, we've been working on something called uh, the Post Office Protocol. So the Post Office Protocol is a really cool idea. Um, you, so basically, on Ethereum, whenever you send a token, you need to pay gas, right? So the post office protocol, uh, which is actually like already, we're pretty far along. We're just beta testing, beta testing at the moment. So we'll be releasing that uh, pretty soon, ideally. Um, and I think we can even play with if the hackers are interested. We actually can let them play with that. But it allows you to send SLP tokens without gas. So you can actually send USD without any PCH, without any sort of gas. Like it will just use the USDT to pay for the gas. And, and that's like, for example, that's a long-term mandate. We are doing research into having, you know, more functionality, you know, having the tokens being uh, partially uh, minor validated at some point. So that adds a whole bunch of new features. Uh, the long-term mandate, I think that's like a harder question. I, yeah, when you say mandate, I almost think of like political speeches, right? I almost say I'm handed four years to decide what the long-term uh, goal of SLP uh, would be. But uh, yeah, the long-term long mandate, I would say, is that not only we want to add more advanced functionality, we want to make this the best, you know, one of the best token solutions available in the entire blockchain world. We also want to emphasize that this is very lightweight. Like plug and play is like a big, big, big thing for, for us and for me. Like, like the fact that we want to be able to have developers that literally can just get into tokenize their projects with a few clicks, like tokenize their projects with a very low level of understanding of smart contracts. And that is kind of like our mandate that we're going to work towards like things like that, that are like a little bit like we're almost trying to differentiate ourselves from the rest of the cryptocurrency world, right? Because everyone's going, DeFi, everyone's going like strongly DeFi, everyone's going like three, four different chains, you know, on the same blockchain. Um, so we want to go with like more out of the box thinking. Like, how do we really build tools uh, that really help, you know, businesses and really help users like around the world, uh, getting uh, more adoption around the world? And um, a really cool thing that you know, James Kramer, the, uh, the guy that created uh, SLP is working on is something called the rewards tool. So the rewards tool is like this new tool that's been built that has like an incredible amount of functionality when it comes to being able to, uh, so you would be able to do uh, dividends, you'll be able to do all sorts of complicated, you know, schemes where you can basically reward uh, users for, you know, holding a token or using a token and you can, and they're gonna build an explorer which allows you to track how, 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 how good is this project at delivering, right? So you can actually go back and almost do like a accountability factor of, hey, have they been paying these dividends out? Have they been paying these rewards out, right? Because 
a lot of uh, blockchain projects, they promise stuff right at the beginning, and then afterwards they just disappear, right? So he's going to build a tool that allows you to keep all these projects uh, accountable. So I think that's very exciting. Um, I don't know if that answers the question of what SLP's long-term mandate is, because I feel that's a very, very, um, yeah, that's a very, very, like, kind of question, right? So yeah, no, yeah, that I hope that that was like a you know a packed question and uh, equally packed answer. I loved where that went. I, I learned so much about the SLP Foundation on a larger scale there. Um, there's another really interesting question here. So you mentioned, you know, a lot of folks being in, uh, involved with the Ethereum space. So suppose you wanted to take an Ethereum um, uh, ERC721 token, which is the NFT standard on, on Ethereum, and port it over to SLP. Is that just as easy? Um, how would you go about doing that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't exactly know like the technical uh, spec we're doing it, but I do know something called, there's a wallet called Casa Toucan, and um, the guy, you know, did Spells of Genesis, so that's a very early, we're talking like a long time ago now. This is like before 2 you know, one seven. So he made a game called Spells of Genesis, and Counterparty was a token solution on Bitcoin, on Bitcoin Core until they decided to limit the block size, right? So that killed all the token solutions on uh, Bitcoin Core. But uh, he basically, we've been chatting, and he's actually building an interoperability. This is going to be big. This, he's, build, he's building an exchange that allows you to move NFTs across chains. So you can move NFTs from Aave, from to Ethereum, to Avalanche, to, to Bitcoin Cash, to you know Counterparty. And um, it's, it's doable, because a lot of it is just uh, metadata, right? So as long as the the, the difficulty I've seen with this is that the spec, you, you need to, the spec needs to be compatible. And because uh, different game items, different NFT items have different ways of storing data, right? Um, sometimes it doesn't translate very well. So for example, take Avalanche. Uh, they have a very limited NFT capability that doesn't have much they can do in terms of NFTs, right? So if we were to, move NFT tokens to um, uh, Avalanche, we would actually be limited in what we can transfer in terms of the metadata, right? Because the metadata is where you store the genetics, where you store the images, where you store the game stats, where you store the, you know, any sort of NFT uh, data you need there on chain. Uh, but as far as this one, ERC721, ERC721 is not a complicated spec. So definitely, you know, moving ERC721 SLP NFT will just be a one one on one swap, so definitely it can be done. But how it would be done, I don't know. Uh, I remember seeing a spec of it, but I I don't know where I put it. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that, JT? Um. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I I think really uh, it would be a very cool project for someone to build a similar sort of atomic swap. Uh, maybe using oracles or something to determine, uh, you know, if transfers are going through and burning those tokens and recreating them on a on a new chain. As far as uh, specifics for different chains, um, yeah, I think you know it really comes down to. I think for simple simple NFTs, it's not going to be a giant issue. But as soon as you start adding in the scripting, um, then you know if you're moving to a, a system that's Quite a bit different. Of course, that's going to be a, a lot more challenging because you have to recreate everything. So, um, yeah, it's, it's going to really depend on the chain and, and how much functionality you're taking advantage of for that specific chain. Super cool. Yeah, and it can also be a long. I mean, I actually know with Casa uh, Toucan. Um, yeah, actually, I'm not going to open it. But I know of Cast 2 can their exchange is not exactly decentralized. So you could actually, we could also do like a centralized swap, which is not ideal, but it, it can be done if you trust the company. Um, so, you know, you simply just literally burn one token and mint the other one. So, um, yeah, it, it, it can be done. But exactly how that would be done, like trustlessly, I, I wouldn't know the answer to that. It's, it's a good one, Jerry. I think maybe we should investigate that a little bit. 
Maybe it's something for um, if it doesn't already exist or like, you know, there's there's certain headway ma- being made. Maybe that's something uh, one of the teams can take on as a challenge and, and work on a little bit during the, the hackathon. It'd be interesting to see. Cool. Um, so that, that wraps up the, the questions that we had there. Um, did you have some more to talk about through your presentation, Joey? Uh, you, you mean do I have more to present or do you mean? No, like did, did were you finished your presentation or were you just pausing for questions there? Oh, I was just pausing for questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, how much more time do I have, Jordan? I don't you know have as I'm... as much time as you'd like, my friend. I'm I'm at the edge <laughs> of my seat. Yeah, I think, and we've I've been oh, seeing okay. more and more people join the stream. So I don't think you're boring anybody. So uh, yeah, c- please continue. <laughs> oh, yeah. No pressure. Um, so so what is the what is the simple ledger protocol? So we talked about you know the reason why I asked that question about understanding you know the UTXO model. Uh, because understanding the UTXO model is pretty much key to understanding how SLP works, right? And at, at its core, SLP is actually really simple. I mean, this is like, you know, I was talking to JT about how do we explain this, because actually it's actually really simple. You know, it was kind of like we were, we were doing a dry run, you know, me and JT, and we're kind of going like, yeah, well, I don't know what's there to talk about, because it's actually a really, it's really elegant. Let's put it that way. It's a very elegant idea. Um, so what a simple ledger protocol. Um, I will let this animation play out. Yeah. So, you know, a simple ledger protocol is basically, we just basically put the token transactions and write that on a Bitcoin cash transaction. So it's nested within a Bitcoin cash transaction. Um, the SLP UTXOs follow the same principles as the BCH UTXOs, which we talked about. But we, uh, from the spec, so what what happened after when uh, the the Kramer spec basically added a bunch of transaction types, right? So here's where I'm gonna, so let's show you one of the transaction types. So this is how, well, yeah. So if you look at this, actually, you look at this, this looks exactly like what we showed you just now, right? We showed you how, Bitcoin Cash works. Well, if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Because Bitcoin Cash literally resides inside, you know, a BCH, a Bitcoin Cash UTXO, right? So what Bitcoin, what SLP is, is SLP is, SLP is a op return data. So I would, uh, if anyone wants to under, you know, if anyone wants to understand exactly technically how SLP works, I would just check out this uh, type one specification. The type one specification is basically the original thing uh, James Kramer and a bunch of guys put together that describes exactly the specification of simple ledger protocol. And in this document, to be honest, like it describes things in way better terms than I can. So I'm gonna drop that in the crowd cache. So, you know, that's definitely like, I highly recommend looking at this because this explains SLP so much better than I can in many ways. And why is that not copying? Yeah, one thing with uh, uh, that I think is probably most important to take away from this is all of the SLP UTXOs are, are really just Bitcoin Cash UTXOs that have additional SLP data associated with them. So everything's running completely on top of Bitcoin Cash, and it's uh, for for some people they think it's kind of I, I think it's kind of hard to understand because a lot of people think of it as sort of a separate system, and and it is to some extent. But um, yeah, you know, it, it's it's really just running on top of Bitcoin Cash, and and the same way that Bitcoin Cash works is how SLP works directly on on top of the the same <clears throat> the same data structures and everything. So you can have a, a Bitcoin Cash uh, output that's worth one Bitcoin Cash and one thousand spice, or, or whatever it may be. Um, so yeah, they're they're like intimately linked. Yeah. So basically, I I just posted this back. I probably should post some of these links um, in the chat. So this is a great one to look at. Uh, I, I think this is probably one of the most important documents. If you really wanted to uh, understand the ins and outs 
of how it all works because this basically explains it way better than how I can do it in a presentation. So when we go at that, so let's, before we dive into the types of transaction, right? I mean, let's sort of understand that within each Bitcoin Cash transaction, there is actually like a field inside the Bitcoin Cash transaction where you can actually put a little bit of data in. And it was designed in this way. So basically, Bitcoin Cash could be programmed. Oh, sorry, Bitcoin could be programmed. Bitcoin Cash is actually designed in a way that allows it to be scripted and it allows you to put data on chain. A limited amount of data, but it allows you to do it. So what we have is something called an op return field. And an op return field allows you to put uh, a certain, a small amount of data in the field that rides with the transaction, right? And so for example, let's look at, uh, let's look at the simplest one. Let's look at, say if you wanted to send the SLP transaction, right? So literally here, I don't know if you can see my screen well, but this op return would be converted to a hex decimal and be put inside the op return of the actual Bitcoin Cash transaction. So you can see here, like you have the locat ID, you have the token type, which would be type one, then the transaction, what's, it, what's the transaction type send, um, the token ID, you know, the output quantities and so on. Um, so via these, um, you know, this, this format in the op return, we go back, to the presentation, we can actually nest that into the BCH transaction and have a, I would say almost parallel, parallel protocol that runs right alongside Bitcoin Cash. And exactly how that works, I'll sort of go into that a bit. Uh, but so let's go through the sort of three main ones, three operations. So you have a send um, SLP. So it's just like literally like sending BCH. Um, we have generating tokens, right? So there's a transaction type that allows you, like the one we did just now for uh, with Electron Cash, we actually did this. So we took a BCH, BCH UTXO, that's unspent, and then we basically created a um, output where we actually, the output, this output here is where we put the data for the SLP. So that's where we, where we put the opportunity data that I showed you from the spec one. And that's gonna be nested inside the Bitcoin Cash transaction. So this is actually a Bitcoin Cash transaction, uh, but it's the SLP is writing on the Bitcoin Cash transaction. Um, so- Can I provide a little clarity on this quick? Um, uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, this shows uh, just the, <clears throat> uh, the op return acts kind of differently compared to a, uh, to Bitcoin Cash, um, because instead of creating a output that you can spend later, it's it's unspendable, right? It's just like metadata that you can add to a transaction. So within this transaction, the the first uh, output is actually the op return data. So if you're looking on a uh, block explorer, um, some of them show show op return data, and a lot of them don't. Uh, but if you're using, you know. Uh, a transaction decoder or something, you can see it quite easily. Um, and then, yeah, you'll have the uh, different Bitcoin Cash UTXOs. And you know, depending on how the Genesis transaction is set up, um, some of those will be associated with the SLP token that you just created. So. Cool. Yeah, so moving on. Uh, I don't know why this slide. Okay, so. Minting tokens. So, you know, this is, this, by the way, one of the cool, I'm like, I love this feature because this is one of the coolest features of like SLP. The fact that when you create your own token, you can actually create a special kind of token that's called a minting baton. And that goes on top of the token supply. So remember when we did the Electron Cash uh, example, it actually asked if I wanted a fixed supply or not, right? So if I didn't click the fix fixed supply, what it would have done, it would have given me a minting baton. And the minting baton is a token I can use to make more tokens, but I could also use that, I can also program that token to make tokens in a scheme I, I would like to do. Um, so you could actually pair that with a smart contract 
uh, which we'll be doing in a workshop that's going to come later in the month. And you would be able to use that to create all sorts of schemes for how to distribute your token, scheduling, you know, staking, and so on and so forth. Uh, but this is a really cool feature because it essentially means you can control the supply, right? And you know, it's also great because you can all burn this token. So you know, uh, for example, for my game, I have a minting baton for my uh, native token. But at some point, I'm just going to announce. I'm going to announce like publicly, I'll burn this token, and I can show people I burnt it uh, by making you know a burning transaction. And once I burn this minting, minting baton, like everyone will be able to see on the explorer that I cannot create any more game tokens. Uh, but up to that point, I'm free to experiment with the economics, right? So that gives people like, a lot of flexibility if they're thinking about you know tokenomics and you know adding how to add a token to the project. Um, you know, keep the minting baton, and you can always burn it later. You know, so that's uh, that's one this is one thing I really really love, and that also kind of is going to come into like NFTs and a bunch of other stuff. Um, let's see. So, so. Yeah, so this is basically self-explanatory. Let's say, um, let me gather my breath because I'm gonna... okay. So, so that so now we sort of understand. Right? I mean, I think we have roughly. Oh, I'm just gonna show you this as well. So there's like a way. I actually just said how you would burn a token, right? So this is how you burn a token. Do you want to explain this a little bit? How how the tokens burn with the output? Yeah. So <clears throat> you you can take any of basically when you're creating outputs, you can send as many tokens as you want up to the amount of of input tokens. So if you added up all of the ones here, there'd be you know you could send up to eight in this transaction, but you could also send you know zero, and that would that would burn those tokens. And that's the same for the minting baton as well. Um, you just don't pass that on. So yeah, fantastic. Um, yeah, so I think that you know I think the way I sort of the reason I wanted to sort of do it like this, and I feel a lot of people coming from I really want to get the people that are you know coming from other blockchain. Like, like a proof of stake type technology where they're not used to this idea of the DAG, right? The, the, the ledger, the way Bitcoin wor works. So, you know, we need to sort of piece together, like put it together, like how does SLP work, right? So we have all this data. And if you imagine a blockchain, right? Like the gigantic blockchain of Bitcoin cash, which goes all the way back to the Genesis block, right? Genesis block of Bitcoin. So this is like, what, 11 years, 12 years, something like that, right? A decade. And nested in this, since SLP is all this data, right? So when we interact with the blockchain, we need some way to prune that data. We need some way to interact with that data, right? Like all this, all this SLP data is inside the Bitcoin Cash blockchain, right? So we need a way to basically, well, find these, to find these transactions, right? Otherwise, how do we exactly find out what is being done on SLP, and that's really where um, you know the the explorers. I'm going to start with explorers because this is probably the easiest way to sort of introduce the idea. Um, so yeah, we can go to explorer. So let's let's just run for explorer, um, and we can go. I should start a new one. Yeah, so the important thing is you gotta be asking yourself, right? Like, okay, now I'm gonna open the simple ledger explorer. And this is gonna this is an explorer that's gonna show me everything that's happening right now, right? On um, SLP. So you see you got mint token being mo moved around. Soda. I heard soda, like I think that's a new project, right? It sounds familiar. We have mint token, so that's the that's the one I told you about the, the really amazing tipping point. Zap, that's a wallet that's basically on SLP. They're they're actually adding loads and loads of very, very cool features. Um advise, advise you know, definitely check that out. USDH, that's a stable coin. Um USDT is being moved around. So yeah, we can see 
stuff on here. So, so uh, if I go to like, say, okay, let's just play around. Let's go to USDT, right? So USDT gets the token here, and we can see all the transactions, right, on the Explorer. And if I click addresses, it will bring me to the address, right? And then addresses will show me. So it's showing me all this stuff. No, it's showing me, in fact, yeah, it's showing me the stuff with the um, tokens. I'm just trying to find the address find, uh, where it should be on BCH. Because the reason I'm showing you the Explorer is then we're going to talk about, well, as developers, how is this data being drawn out, right? Like, if, you know, we're kind of, kind of working towards that, which is why I'm showing you the Explorer. Um, so you can see here, right, like all the transactions, like what's going on here, like with this stuff, uh, the token, the transaction ID. So let's, let's click at this transaction ID, see what's about. So. Yeah, if you look at the transaction ID of this to token transaction, I don't know what CAM token is. It's for a new project. Um, valid. Is this safe, guys? It says only CAMs.cc. I'm not gonna click. I'm not gonna click on that one because uh, it might be not suitable for work. So I don't know what only CAM is, but uh, it sounds like someone's doing only fast, but a spin-off of it. So I'm not. I am. I am not gonna risk clicking this project link. But we can see. We can see here, yeah. So we can see all the outputs what we're talking about just now. We're talking, we're talking about that model here. We're talking about that model here, right? Like, uh, you know, transaction tokens, right? Like uh, input outputs, right? Input outputs. We can see them here. Inputs, all the outputs, right? Where you know this guy inputted this amount into this address, this amount of cams. Uh, you know, I, I assume it's a cam site of sorts. Um, and uh, yeah, so you can see all the output here. Um, and that's all riding on the op return data, right? So now we've seen the Explorer, you know, let's have a look at this, right? So press SLP transaction data. It's pulling this up. What is this? Well, this is basically how SLP works. SLP relies on indexing, like relies on the nodes or an external application that scans the blockchain, entire BCH blockchain. And basically, you can see the op return here. Uh, it basically prunes the op return for the spec, which is here, of the SLP type 1 transaction. You can actually see SLP type 1 transaction here. But this is R in hexadecimal. So uh, it won't make much sense. But you can see like the, the transaction data like here, right? And this is really important because um, if you're developing an SLP app, you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna be needing to make queries, right? You're gonna be needing to make queries of who's got your tokens. When you send a token, you need to be able to confirm that that token's been sent there. So there's huge applications to this. So, like, what is SLPDB? Okay. So, SLPDB is, and there is no page on SLPDB. So, SLPDB is one of the, you know, most popular and oldest tools for querying SLP transactions. And this is a type of SLP indexer. There are two, as far as I'm aware, there are two SLP. Well, actually, there are free SLP indexers, as far as I'm aware. Uh, uh, so SLP indexers, you know, SLPDB is basically an application that you run, people run on top of nodes. And as it runs parallel to the node, it reads the entire DAG of the uh, Bitcoin Cash blockchain. And basically, it parses that data and it takes all the SLP data. So you can do queries to find out uh, all the SLP transactions, everything that's going on. You know, and you can even get notifications and stuff like that. Um, and only with that can we like interact with SLP, right? Because otherwise, if there would be no easy interface to um, interact with uh, SLP 
uh, sorry, S the SLP DAG, right? Like uh, the SLP operating data on the Bitcoin Cash blockchain. So we have a bunch of indexers. SLP DB is the oldest one. It's the first one that was built by James Kramer. Uh, there are other ones. There are SLP, the SLP indexer by Bitcoin.com. Uh, James Kramer has just worked on really amazing one. It's like native um, SLP indexing on BCHD uh, that we will be covering uh, about in the next workshop. And we'll talk about that a little bit because it's a relatively new tool, uh, not as established as SLPDB is, but it's very, very, like, very, very cool. So, uh, but for the purposes of this uh, tutorial, let's stick with SLPDB because it's going to be the easiest one to run through. So now if you can sort of imagine it, like you have the block, so you have the blockchain, right? You have all the op return data in the, that's in the blockchain, that's basically all SLP transaction, right? And then you have the SLP indexer, like SLP DB, that basically is parsing all these um, uh, blocks and all the data on the entire Bitcoin Cash, uh, you know, history. Uh, to take out all the data, data. What it does is it puts it in a MongoDB, uh, so you can do these, uh, you can do these queries um, on SLPDB. So yeah, it's uh, originally a fork of a BitDB project, and it stores all SLP data, uh, uh, data, a Mongo-based database for the jQuery, right? It, um, uses uh, Mongo, allows complex queries to compile statistics and just about everything you need to get SLP data on, um, yeah, SLP data on the blockchain. Right? The querying is done using MongoDB and uh, with optional JSON processing uh, provided by JQ. Um, what is MongoDB? MongoDB is a no SQL database that stores collection of documents. I'm sure you're like used to the mean stack. That should be pretty familiar to you guys. Um, have you guys uh, used MongoDB or are familiar with it? Um, uh, this is a question JT wanted to ask, just in case there's any. Yeah, I think so it was like 50 50. Yeah, let's take a look here on our poll. Um, uh, so we've gotten some more. Um, feedback, it's actually 66% now um, saying no and thir oh, oh, some it's changing before my eyes. 70% uh, are saying they have not used MongoDB and 30% uh, say they have. Um, yeah, cool. Cool. Do you, uh, do you just want to you you wanna, you wanna sell MongoDB for a little bit, JT? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so <clears throat> we have a little example here that sort of goes through some of the operations, but uh, MongoDB is pretty cool. It's, uh, I'm sure most people are familiar with SQL databases. Instead of uh, an SQL database, MongoDB just stores what it calls documents, which are these, uh, it's basically just a, a JSON document, right? It's uh, uh, some data, so it, it's not relational in the same way, but um, one of the big benefits for it, uh, and I tried to implement something sort of similar for SLP using uh, Postgres before, but um, it was just uh, quite too slow with the indexing. So because of the way that MongoDB is set up, it, it can actually scale pretty well. Um, it's not perfect, but uh, yeah, it fits pretty well with um, querying uh, data for this and especially exposing it through uh, some sort of interface where you can toss up uh, queries and, and even have services that uh, provide um, provide querying ability to people um, anywhere. So that's really, really cool. Um, it's, uh, it's a lot harder, I'm sure it's possible, but uh, to, to write as easy of queries with uh, SQL queries. So hopefully this uh, this little thing that we put together will sort of show you the idea with that. Um, you know, you can go through and add multiple layers of, of filtering on what you're sort of matching for and provide transformations on that data and, and sort of build it up um, to finally get what you really want. Uh, and, and that's actually really cool because for a lot of, uh, at least for me, a lot of the time using like different APIs or different ways, you know, maybe like RPC calls 
to interact with uh, cryptocurrencies, um, it feels really limiting, right? And you have to build your own indexes and, and index stuff your own way. And with this, you, you really don't have to worry about any of that, which is really, really, really cool. Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of the the, the short of it. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, I, I guess you'll see. Are you right here, Joey, to sort of go through some of this stuff? Or yeah, I am. I'm just uh, making sure I have the uh, right right uh, demo. Huh, not doing it. Just give me a moment. Okay. Yeah, so we're going to go through a, a handful of different queries here and sort of build one up that starts from something sort of simple. Um, it's just for a, a toy problem, but uh, the entire simple ledger.info explorer is built using. Um, SLPDB queries, and that's all open source. So you're you're more than welcome to go through and sort of look at some of those for um, trying to calculate uh, different statistics. Those are probably some of the most interesting ones. I, I would say is uh, calculating statistics over time. But uh, yeah, a really cool example is actually both of these apps. Uh, this explorer here, and uh, you know this explorer here. They're both actually built using uh, SLPDB as a kind of uh, custom API, right? So, so you know, I mean, if you can build this, it, you know, you can actually use SLPDB to build a lot of stuff, right? Because it's actually querying a lot. This stuff is querying a lot of data. And if you, if you see this SLP transaction data here and you hover over by, actually, now you have to click on it, okay? It actually shows you what the query is for this. Like, what is the return that they're using to show you that? I'm so tempted to click on onlycams.cc. That's, no, I'm not going to do it. It's just it's too risky, right? Too risky. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah, no, <I'm> not. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's just like onlycams.cc sounds I, I, I'm going to create a poll asking people if they think you should click it or not. <laughs> it's kind of got a cool logo, right? Is that meant to be like how? <laughs> from uh, Space yeah, it's, Oh, it's a very artistic site. Did you create this? Did you create this token? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's impossible. Say um, token age. How much was the token? I'm actually curious about uh, cams. That's TC. So what's the minting date? August 25, huh? So it's pretty new. There are all sorts of like really cool projects that I don't know about um, that's happening on SLP. So go ahead and uh, make your voice heard, guys, in the in the poll section. Should Joey click the mysterious link? Do you think he <laughs> definitely should or absolutely not? Let us know in the polls. If it's not, if it's not I will. If it's not I will, I will close it like in two seconds. There, yeah, there is a question there. I was going to save it towards the end, but if you want to answer it now, you can go ahead uh, there, Joey. Can the SLP UTXO model be used for other data sets that are not token related? Uh, not that I'm aware of unless it rides on an NFT, right, JT? Um, well, I think the same idea can be used for a... Uh, yeah, I mean, you could use the same idea for other things. I'm not sure what those things would be um, offhand. But, whatever, uh, yeah, I mean, whatever you can think of. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the core idea of, of coloring um, different outputs and applying metadata to them could definitely be used in more ways than just what SLP has. Um, and there's actually, so one of the kind of cool things with SLP actually is that um, it's designed to be extensible, so you can have new token types that actually uh, add, you know, completely new functionality. Like right now, we have regular tokens and, and NFTs, but um, if there's something that you wanted to build that used the same sort of base uh, for mm -hmm. the same sort of uh, 
yeah, the, you know, riding on top of UTXOs and, and sort of inheriting a lot of the infrastructure. Um, that would probably be a really smart way to do it and just creating a new token type on top of it, um, which doesn't even have to be a token, right? Especially for this, this question. Um, but yeah, so that's definitely possible. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, and there's kind of some interesting stuff there too, right? Because yeah, say for games, you, you might want to store more, um, you know, there's different ways you can do it. It could be like per application, but if you want to make like a game protocol that, that had like certain um, attributes that you could do or <clears throat> the minting baton idea is pretty interesting, but there, there's other stuff you could probably do too, right? Um, that maybe isn't quite a minting baton, but something sort of similar. So yeah, I mean, those could be built. W one, one thing I think would be really, really cool is you could actually um, build a uh, more, a, and you know, it would totally go against the, the sort of ethos with this, but if we ignore that, um, yeah, you, you could actually build a more complex scripting system on top of Bitcoin Cash using SLP with a new token type and having these tokens run, you know, um, either like, you know, token creator defined scripts or, or something along that, or maybe just whatever it is for that new type. But yes, yeah, so there's there's really a lot that you can do with it. Um, that uh, yeah, we're sort of just scratching the surface and trying to get everything, everything on that part really, really solid. So, cool. Yeah, it's um, like, yeah, I think I think often I've I when I talk to folks about like blockchain, they ask, oh, well, what is it for? And I'm like, well, whatever you can build on it. Like it's up to uh, creative people to come along and like we have amazing things already being built on it. And it's, you know, it, and it's many, in many cases it is the wild, wild west. So like um, the call is on all the folks in the hackathon, what else can you build using SLP, uh, uh, SLP technology? And that's essentially what we're here for. I'm, I'm excited to see what comes out of this. Um, just to check in on that poll, should Joey click on the mysterious link? We have 60% of folks, uh, you yeah. know, not wanting to be disturbed or to, to, to have anything um, ill happen. So we have an absolutely not majority, uh, although 40% are, are the risky ones. We, they want to know. They want to know. <laughs> they think you should definitely click on it. <laughs> yeah, two of those yes votes were me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I uh, have a sort of technical problem uh, that I just need to sort of spot out. Just give me a moment. Um, just hang on. It's going to be a bit awkward. Okay, Jim. Well, wanna... I, can, I, can, I can sort of talk about some uh, stuff. It's just that I had my notes here and then I ran out of battery. So okay. Just, uh, no worries. So while we wait for Joey to come back, let's just check in on the chat. Uh, I've been seeing some great um, convo happening here. Some uh, we got a lot of folks that are dropping in their simple ledger addresses. So if you um, didn't hear earlier, you can drop your simple ledger address in there. And I think we're uh, I think I saw that we got a couple tokens um, earlier on. I dropped my address in here, so that was cool. Um, yeah, how are you guys enjoying the stream so far? Let me know in the chats. What's in the box? Jerry wants to know. Yeah, and if you trust your uh, simple ledger address in, maybe uh, you, you, if you're lucky, you might end up with some Bitcoin cash at the end of this talk. So, Woo, Bitcoin yeah. cash, airdrop. Oh, the spice. The spice was flowing earlier. It was amazing. Um, we, we definitely got to integrate Crowdcast and Spice Bot so that we can tip people, uh, tip each other in Spice because it was it was going nuts. There were chilies flying all over the place. Yeah, I think I think actually that's going to be a really big thing in the near future 
is needing to, uh, yeah, have people uh, tipping content and have, you know, even if it's just a super tiny amount of, of money um, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, but, but something, because I think spam is going to get so much worse and I don't think anyone's prepared for it, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, everyone's gone through that already, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I, I think that's one of the most interesting things that people could work on, actually. Uh, it's such a giant problem. Right now, people have it mostly uh, mostly on top of it, but I, I think we're going to see a, a new wave where, you know, we're, we're not on the winning side for, for a year or two anymore. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. so, yeah, I think that's probably the best solution, right? It's having something. You need something where it's like, oh, you know, this costs a tenth of a cent. Well, there you go, you know, that's... It's something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and the 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 huge problem of like botnets and stuff like that, um, being able to like confirm your unique humanness and a digital ID. These are all like very key parts of the the decentralized digital economy that we're building that haven't fully been solved yet, but there's some very interesting work being um, put towards that. And so that was one of the things that came to mind when the question came up, what else can SLPs be used for? Uh, what are your thoughts on that, JT? Can we use it for some sort of digital ID maybe? Um, would that be a, 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 an effective use case or not so much? Yeah, I think, uh, and actually I was just thinking about this the other day that, um, yeah, so you remember how, um, I don't know if they still have it, but uh, it, was, it was really popular at the time when Facebook first came out. They had the um, <clears throat> friends of friends uh, feature. And uh, yeah, so it'd bring in, you know, you could see sort of this, and I think, yeah, LinkedIn still does, does a similar thing. And so you can see these sort of connections between people. Um, and yeah, I think using uh, tokens with that and sort of vouching for authenticity of the person or you know reliability or trustworthiness or whatever it may be and being able to do this in a way where it's decentralized and backed by you know some sort of proof that you know this is an identity it doesn't have to be tied to, to a, a document somewhere or, or something but it but it's you know this is an identity and uh you know i, I really like that the the work that keybase is doing with trying to try trying to tie together different social identities with public key pairs. I think that's that's really cool. And I think that's sort of part of that same thing too, right? Where, you know, you, you don't, I don't think in the future, uh, well, you know, we have passports and stuff like that. And, and it sort of works, but, uh, you know, I think people can do way better than that. And I think that they can do it on a, a global scale and, and not half it be tied to any central authority and, and have a protocol that just works for everyone um, and is completely outside of any government. So I think that's like really a, a good goal to go go towards in general. Mm -hmm. um, and and but just also from like a, a utility use case, you know, using those sorts of uh, old technologies doesn't work at all for you know uh, people people can can make fake documents or whatever. I mean, it, it doesn't really work, but it's it's quite hard to make a fake um, key pair. You know, like no, yeah. nobody's figured that out. Yeah. So you, you can print out passports or whatever all day, but um, yeah. So I think that's going to be like really central for that. Um, and uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I think yeah, yeah, yeah. I just like literally had to like. I think it's, it's, it's it, yeah. If you, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed about it because. Uh, I literally was like, I didn't, I fully charged my laptop and you know, I thought these MacBooks run for like a few hours and apparently they don't, so it literally like just ran out. Yeah, no, when, when you're streaming, <laughs> uh, for sure, it definitely yeah. takes a lot more energy. So we're glad you're still with us and, and uh, your, your laptop is still surviving. Are you all plugged in and, and ready to continue? In five seconds, yeah, I'm just like literally loading. Uh, okay. Cool, cool. Just five seconds so on the note of uh digital identity jt i'm i'm very curious i know you are you 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 obtain or you maintain a high level of anonymity um on the internet and in the virtual space which is also why you're not on camera today do you want to talk to us a little bit about 
um, you know, maintaining your anonymity and how you go about that or like any any um, suggestions for folks that want to create a little bit of distance between their online identity with uh, from their real life identity? Sure. So, yeah, uh, <clears throat> I, I think it's really, uh, I think a lot of people think of it as like a binary thing. Um, and it's actually incredibly hard to uh, to be fully uh, anonymous or, you know, it, I, I think, and I had a similar thought in the past that it's like, yeah, you know, there's people out there, nobody can find them, you know, they're, they're totally secret. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think that's a, a realistic goal for even, you know, very, very few people can pull that off. But what's really, really useful is if you can try to do that um, and, you, and you just make things a little bit harder, uh, which actually is a lot harder, right? Um, because if you, you know, just, just from the simple, the simple start of, of, you know, not giving out your uh, broadcasting, your GPS location 24 seven and, and your full legal name and, <laughs> and everything like that, you're already quite, quite a ways of the way there, right? And uh, yeah, so one of the big things that I think is really important with it is, uh, you know, there's this uh, uh, worldwide uh, spy net on, on everyone and, and surveillance. And the reason that that's able to exist is because it's essentially free uh, for governments to do this, right? And and it kind of comes back to the same thing with uh, spamming, like how I said before, if it even costs a tenth of a cent, it's it's uh, going to cut it down a lot. And I think, yeah, you know, if you make if you make a spying on people cost you know a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, well, I think that's going to you know reduce the amount of uh, capability that that's going to happen with that just massively. And uh, you know, it just can't happen on a on a global scale. So I, I think it's really important for people to do more of that. Um, and it's just to whatever level that you can, right? It, it doesn't have to be all the time, or it could be an alternative identity or whatever, but just throw as much stuff out there and make it as hard as you can all the time to make it more expensive for people who are um, using public data for things that might not be very good. And I think if you're doing that, you're, you're causing, you know, uh, I mean, how cool would it be? I, like, I have no idea, but maybe it's like, nobody's even bothered, but you know, how cool would it be if, if uh, you know, a few people maybe uh, at BlockHack collectively caused uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of trying to track these people. I mean, just that alone, even if you find everyone, it's like, wow, you know, that used up a really a really good bit of their budget, you know, that, that cut out, you know, maybe millions of other people um, mm -hmm. that they could be spying on. So uh, that, that's sort of how I look at it. Uh, yeah, as far as like, you know, different technologies or stuff like, you know, a lot of people advocate for Tor. I think that's a, a cool idea and might help, but I, I'm pretty sure that's compromised. Um, I think a lot of the technology, you know, it, but at the same time, you know, it's, I don't really know the internals of that, but if it is compromised, it, it probably costs money to actually utilize those, uh, those vulner, vulner, <clears throat> excuse me, vulnerabilities. So it, if that costs just a little bit of money, you know, that's a, a giant success. Um, and it's kind of cool too, you know, it's like, yeah, I think, uh, I don't know. It, yeah, it just, it really shifts the power away from from uh, certain structures that maybe uh, yeah. might associate an identity with something negative or, or positive where they don't deserve it. And if you just wipe that slate clean, um, that's kind of a cool thing as well, you know, because you, you can just operate on your own and, and go from there. Yeah, that's super fascinating. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. And, uh, you know, it goes back to like the the original core ethos, I guess, of, of Bitcoin, like the, the mysterious Satoshi Nakamoto, who we still don't know to any any degree of certainty who, who this person uh, or people were. Um, so it's, yeah, I think it's... Um, a central theme to uh, the crypto space, the blockchain space of um, at least becoming more aware of the amount of information, the type of information you're putting out there and, and making um, conscious decisions of, of what you are willing to share. So that's, that's amazing hearing your thoughts on that. Thank you. How are we doing, Joey? 
Yeah, so I, mean, I, I really apologize, guys, but I, yeah, I got, I got, I can't believe, like, of all the things that would have got me battery. It's, it's all yeah, good. Like, uh, Apple, Apple marketing. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, good. I mean, I think like, on that topic, uh, it's, it's really interesting, you know, before jumping into the SLP TV, that we're seeing sort of an intersection between sort of the anon sort of movement. And at the same time, there's like, a regulation, like we're also butting heads with regulation, right? Things are becoming regulated. Like people want a lot of aspects of blockchain to be legalized, like security tokens and so on. And it's really interesting what's going on because it's almost like it's almost like nobody knows what 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 it's going to look like. And then you know, combine that with COVID, it's just right now. It's like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen next month. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> like six months from now, but uh, it's very exciting. That it's like all kind of like coming to head. Um, so I guess I will go back onto uh, SLPDB, which we were talking about. Finally, I got my fate fixed. So SLPDB, you know, works by inspecting each transaction that occurs in Bitcoin Cash. Uh, it must look at all the transactions, not just the one that appears on SLP, because as I talked, like, you know, we're really talking about the entire Bitcoin Cash blockchain, right? Going all the way back to when Satoshi Nakamoto first created Bitcoin. So actually, it actually has to look through like a lot of that, like basically the entire download of that. Um, but SLP works by basically inspecting those transactions, right? So with these indexers, what we can do is essentially build these like sort of queries or custom APIs. You can build apps entirely around them. Like that's why I showed the explorer because i thought they were great examples of apps that relied on slpdb right because i think a lot of people might look at that and go okay i understand that uh, slp tokens ride on a utxo model but how do you access this stuff as a developer how do you query how do you send you know how do you use this to you know say make a wallet or make an app right so that's why i sort of did it that way to sort of piece it together now we're gonna sort of run through slpdb a little bit um yeah, Genesis transactions on SLP DB uh, will insert into a tokens collection, right? To contain all the token metadata, um, such as token ID, name, symbol, document, UI, and so on. So um, for this, is really easy. You want to see this. So we're on Explorer. We can just uh, create a new tab, right? So I just wanted to show you what a token looks like on Bitcoin Cash. So Spice, my token, you know, <laughs> not really. I mean, I co-founder. A lot of people worked on Spice, so that's not. I can't really say that's like my token. Just, just kick something over my feet, you know, because of cabling and the you know battery situation. So here we go. This is Spice's token page. So here we see sort of like the genesis uh, of uh, Spice which is you know, what we call part of the tokens collection. Every token that's minted goes in the token collection. Um, you can see on Spice here, these are the supported exchanges, um, all the transactions, uh, addresses. Uh, yeah, rich list, like who has a lot of Spice and so on. Um, so here you can see the type one, this is the symbol Spice, eight decimals, the document information. Um, the minting baton here you can see is dead ended, right? So that was what we were talking about earlier, that you can burn the minting baton. But Spice has a, has a mix, has a fixed supply of 1 million tokens. So basically, we, we never had the minting baton. That was gone. So there was only 1 billion Spice, and basically, that's it. There's never been any more Spice. Um, you can see some people have, I think, accidentally burned some Spice. I'm pretty sure that's an accident. I know someone. I know the person that did it. So... <laughs> So uh, I think that, yeah, that's the thing, like, accidental. You didn't really want to burn that spice. Um, so this is like a good sort of overview of what a token looks like you know, on SLP. Um, so yeah, let's look at some of the, tra let's look at some transactions, right? This is a SLP transaction, I already showed you this. This is a spice transaction. Uh, you can see the transaction ID, a token data. It shows you spice, um, the inputs and outputs. Um, so 
what's really cool with this, and you can also see this on you know, Bitcoin.com. Bitcoin.com wallet, you can see this on here. So there's two explorers, uh, simpleledger.info and uh, explore.bitcoin.com will both show you SLP uh, transactions. So, you know, the next thing to do is, okay, so we have this, right? And we kind of go, well, we want to use this and inspect this with SLP DB, you know, the, the query uh, the query database we're talking about that extracts the data from the blockchain, puts it into MongoDB, and allows us, us to just make the, uh, JSON queries, right? Um, so we can take that, and basically I've already done that, so we can actually put that into, uh, so, so that's, no, this is an example of uh, if I, Put the, this is Spice's token ID, and if I put the token ID as query here, um, you can see uh, the DB request is T, so that means the token request. Right? Um, we set the limit at 10. So here you can see the display of the Spice, all the stuff we saw at Explorer just now, right, is basically listed here. You can see the small, the genesis time, timestamp. Uh, we can see the minting, minting button status that, that ended. Um, so next we can actually, you know, put that transaction there I showed you uh, right into the uh, query, right? So this is called a graph query. And, um, you know, this is called a graph query. And all we did is change the DB from D to D. So now we're looking at not, remember we talked about the DAG or right, the tag. So we're talking, we're now looking at the graph of the UTXO. This is like returning information from that transaction that we, we placed. Uh, all we had to do was change DB to G, and now it's showing us, um, you know, this, the, the it, uh, we're using find, and we're going a graph TXN, you know, dot TXID. So put the TXID in, in, uh, in here, and, um, Yeah, I think I might have used a different TXID, but the idea is the same. I mean, I, I think I didn't actually use the TXID from that transaction. But I'm just going to keep going because I don't uh, like, because I have quite a lot to cover. Um, so, so basically, here you can see that it's returning the whole graph, right? So the graph is what I was talking about, uh, the DAG you know, the Bitcoin, the way the ledger, the Bitcoin cash is stored. So here you can see it's extracting all the um, op return data, actually, all the SLP data. So these are all SLP outputs. You can see here, like, this is unspent. So this would mean that this amount has not been sent, right? Um, so for this transaction here, you can see these are inputs that have gone into this. So you, can, you can see almost like every address as a balance, right? So these are the money or tokens coming in, and that's like the output. And here, like if it's unspent, it means that DAG, that uh, ledger tree is basically like come to an end because no one's actually spent that yet. So once that's spent, that becomes a spent transaction, becomes an output, and that will become someone, some other, uh, you know, uh, uh, tra transactions input right on the DAG. Um, so. So next up, what we're gonna do is next up, what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna do a query where we do three unique ones, and with this, you start to see the power of SLPDB being an expanded database backend rather than just an API that you can write very arbitrary queries. So that's very flexible because with APIs, you're all, you know with REST APIs, you're set with you're set with a very sort of specific uh, documentation to what you can do, right? So because we SLPDB was built in a way that was more like an exposed uh, database backend, you can actually use everything that you can do with a, a MongoDB query to basically return data from the SLP, uh, SLP, SLP blockchain, should we call it, that basically runs on top of uh, Bitcoin Cash. So here, we can start seeing more stuff, right? This returns nine different transactions. We can see there are different token hex, uh, ID hexes, but the graph collection doesn't have the full token details here. So if you want to do this, if you want to have the, you know, because we're doing a find, we're not really making a pipeline, right? We're just doing a simple query. So the simple query is returning, uh, you know, these transactions, but 
it's not exactly giving us, hey, you know, can we prune this, add something else to basically say, to basically extract, hey, what is actually the token for these, right? So in the next one, we add here, basically switch this for um, aggregate. An aggregate allows us to uh, do a pipeline. And uh, I'll, I'll let JT explain this a little bit because I find an aggregate, I find that a little bit hard to explain. Uh, would you like to explain this a little bit in an aggregate? Sure. So yeah, for, for a lot of simpler queries, you can get away with just doing find if you want to look for maybe <clears throat> transactions where a certain address is involved or something like that. But uh, as soon as you start getting into uh, situations where you need multiple steps, like, hey, I, I want to search for for this example. It's, uh, yeah, I want to find one of the inputs uh, that has this address from these addresses uh, out of this array. But maybe we want to do more than that, right? So what, what we have in this slide right here is uh, actually just showing basically the equivalent of, of switching a, a simple find query into uh, an aggregate query where we can stack these different uh, operators on top of each other and, and do sort of more advanced queries. So, so the reason that you wouldn't do this necessarily right off the bat is because this is generally a bit slower. Um, so generally, it's <clears throat> if you can get away with it, start with a find query. Um, which works for for most of the simpler queries, but uh, if you want to do more processing, which uh, Joey will go through, um, then yeah, you, you're you're going to have to switch, and you can just switch by uh, doing this, guys, this sort of operation here. If any of you guys want examples of these, I can send these to you. Uh, uh, if you uh, just ask on the chat, and I can basically attach. If you just want to see this, you know, you want the the query format. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's cool. So basically, you know, with the aggregate, we can basically do a pipeline, right? We can, we can do, we can basically take this data that is coming out here. You see it's returned the, the, the data request from here, right? So you can see the results here. Uh, but we can go, we can basically add to that. We can add another uh, thing to the aggregate pipeline. So here, in the next example, we add lookup, right? So lookup now we are going, uh, we added lookup and we're, we're looking up from to the token collection now. So here, the lookup we're looking up from the token collection, which we talked about earlier, that's the collection that includes, it's basically a directory of all XLP tokens. So I guess that's probably the easiest way to explain it. And uh, looking up for, and using our available. So what it's doing is basically taking what has been returned from here and Taking that data and basically being like, hey, let's look into that and then you know, trace that and then extract what token we're talking about. Um, and using our available graph txn dot details uh, dot token ID hex to match against token details dot token ID uh, hex and store this lookup in uh, in the list called token, right? So if you look at return data, there's a lot to scroll through, but we can just like, this is basically like, we can just get, get past. So the first part is the match, right? We've done the match, it's returning all this data. And the second one, we're asking it to look up the token, right? So we go all the way, oh, not we go all the way to the end, there you go. So you see it here, it's actually taken out the, like the token, from the token collection. So you can see that it's basically like taking from data that's returned and then adding another query process to the pipeline, right, to basically uh, crawl more information from what we already have from the, from the addresses that was inputted into there. Um, so let's move to, so, so we can actually do more of this. We can like, um, you know, we can, we can do more of this. And the next thing we can do is we can, we can add like a project, you know, that project, you know, we can basically like flatten the query. You know, you you add you add another pipeline to this, and basically you can just basically like make the return even more what you want. So 
So here we flatten the token array. Um, and uh, yeah, here we flatten the token array. And basically, it's, you know, this is like a nicer data source, I guess. Um, just kind of show you like the flexibility of using this aggregate thing. There's all sorts of things you can do with the MongoDB. Another cool one is unwind. So you can also add like unwind, right? So unwind is pretty useful. It takes each list and returns a new document with a list that's flattened for each value, right? So a lot of time you'll use this in conjunction with inputs and outputs uh, or ones from computed values. Um, so here we um, so here we okay. How do I shrink this window with the Yeah, so here we go, here. We can actually, no, this is not the right one, right? So unwind, yeah, unwind. So unwind, you can see you, we've taken those transactions now. The, the input address, which is by the, this exactly the same as what we did at the start, we're still using those three um, addresses. And then basically now we're extracting like all the tokens, right? So this is like from the token. And then we're like using that as like a pretty cool result showing just the tokens. Um, and then, you know, finally, finally, we can basically use, we can use JQ to process the results, right? And we can use this in the way that takes all that data and basically processes it to make it into application, a data that's useful for an application. Uh, so here, the, the, main, the main thing here is after this uh, uh, quote F, the, this uh, bracket means that we're going to construct an array. And the array is basically the data that's coming out here. Um, usually for processing SLB queries, we'll, use, we'll just format the responses. But we were using JQ to calculate something. You may end up with an object or value instead of array at the end. So this, uh, the square, the two square brackets means we're going to iterate over the input array. So we're inputting this array, which uh, the data from here, and then we're going to use that to format the data we have. So here is the data, how we want to format the data, and we're going to use it to iterate over the input array that we got from the aggregate pipeline. Remember, this is the pipeline. So we basically done a bunch of things. We've taken those addresses. Take, we're taking the data return from this, did lookup, and then we did project. Then now we're basically going, hey, let's you know parse this data to make it into something even more you know digestible, right? For uh, say if you're building an app, uh, you want a very specific return, right? Um, so here we've got a format here, and uh, that means we're going to pipe the list of data into the next stage of processing, right? This is very similar to the like, it's basically Mongo pipeline or Unix pipeline, if, if you, it's easy to think of that way. Um, the curly brackets just means to construct an object. So you see the curly brackets here. And the final bracket is obviously to close the array, right? Um, you know, because we're constructing an array. So, yeah, so once we do that, we return this result here, you see. So this result here now is like really clean data from, from that, you know, from the addresses we put it, showing you the TX ID, the token ID, the symbol, like what we basically formatted here, right? And you can imagine if you're building a wallet, that could be super useful information to return, right? Like just like being able to scan one address and return this instead of returning earlier stuff, which would look like this, right? So, you know, this is probably not as useful to an application as this, right? So uh, we're just basically demonstrating that you can do a lot of um, SLP DB and the queries to get the information you need to build your application. Yeah, and um, that concludes the SLP DB part. Um, do you have anything to add, JT? Did I get anything wrong in particular? No, <clears throat> no, that was great. And yeah, I mean, that, that's really the big selling point with SLPDB is, uh, yeah, you can almost um, make APIs, uh, like reusable APIs for other people. So, you know, 
say for for this sort of toy query, you could have someone else tossing in a bigger list of of input addresses um, that they're looking at, and you know that's the only thing they have to change, and then they can get a nice date out of it. So, um, right right with the little interface, you can see <clears throat> the uh, the URL um, to go to, and all that that is is uh, is base 64 encoded version of the query that you just did in the uh, the the play pen or whatever you want to call it um, to, to try to test these queries out. So um, yeah, we, we tried really hard to make it sort of easy for people to explore and try different stuff and um, make it really easy to, to have an interactive environment for testing these sort of queries. Yeah, so I'm just gonna pay, I'm just gonna paste the link here. That is like slp.dev is like a good place for a lot of documentation for SLP, and that page just lets just ex this guy lets you explains a lot about what you can do on uh, query, querying SLP DB. So I just put that in just so people can if they want to explore more, they can. If you want any of these examples, I'm happy to to paste those over. Is there? Um, Yep, we already got them pasted in. So, do we have any questions about SLP DB from the audience? I guess that's a no. Yeah, I don't see any questions about SLP DB, um, but I see a question about NFTs that we could probably save towards the end uh, during the Q and A. So, unless there's any specific so questions about SLP DB, or right, go ahead, Joey. Yeah, no, so I see a lot of NFT um, uh, questions, and obviously I'm working on a game, so uh, be sure to come to my NFT workshop, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Plug, plug for the next workshop. Yeah, we <laughs> have a, a, an entire workshop dedicated to NFTs and how SLP um, fits into all that. So, oh, I, I guess they removed their question. They're going to come and they're going to come to your workshop <laughs> and ask the question there. Um, okay. cool. Right, so let's move on, because I, I realize we're kind of, the time -ish. right? So uh, yeah, making making your own uh, transactions. Um, this is an example of SLP Lite. There are a couple of different ways to make uh, your own SLP transactions. Uh, one easy way is using SLP Lite with default configuration. Um, I will put that example um, in the. So this allows you to send a token by just pressing a private key and address a token ID um, in. And the amount. Um, we also have like REST API, uh, full stack cash, that allows you to use REST API to send transactions. Uh, there's a BCH integration, so once that's complete, you can use gRPC to basically create your own transactions. Uh, we're not going to go over this like super uh, detailed because the next workshop that we're going to do, we're going to cover a lot of this stuff in detail because we have many many tools on SLP on how to build stuff. Uh, but I'm happy to send documentation and stuff like that. I'm just going to go and paste this. Yeah, so JT, you have the SLP Lite. Um, I'm just gonna, if you have the SLP light link, I will just. Uh, yeah, I'll post it. Yeah, because for some reason it's not like uh, letting me post it. So, here we go. Yeah, so I, there's a link, you can check it out. Um, this is uh, one of the, this is the probably the easiest way to send a transaction on the SLP. Uh, do you want to run through the JT a little bit, just the code? Sure. So, um, yeah, really all you do with this is, uh, yeah, it's specifically designed to be sort of uh, <clears throat> the most opinion opinionated. So you just want to send a transaction. You can use SLP Lite. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, it's also built to be extensible, though, so you can add more transaction functionality on top. But yeah, the, the base to this is just really um, really sort of getting to the core of it. You want to send tokens from this person to another person. Um, here you go. You know, 
Um, so generally, you'd, you'd load in a private key from you know, an environment variable or something and, and set the uh, to address to something dependent on you know, where you have to send for, for your function. And probably the token ID would be in your configuration as well. Um, the only part that might be a, a tiny bit confusing is uh, the actual amount. So um, for SLP, you can have uh, decimals set. So say you had three decimals, right? So you can have a, uh, what that means is you can break a token down when you're, when you're sending and user interfaces, you can send 0 .001. Um, but how SLP actually works is it just deals with uh, base units. So that the idea of decimals is really just for, uh, for user interfaces. So with this, you, you just send the base units um, so that would be a thousand in that case if you wanted to send uh, one token that has three decimals, um, because it's uh, you know <clears throat> you're you're just moving the the decimal point over a few times to to get that amount. So that that's the only thing that's maybe not um, as simple as it, as it could be, but at the same time, that's you know that's really what SLP deals in is is these base units. Um, so yeah. Uh, this is kind of cool. It was a library that was made um, to help with Tether integration. Uh, right now, BCHD is in its like last, uh, the integration with SLP into it is in like the last stages of testing. And we're hoping to add this as a back end to this. I mean, we're, we're going to, so um, that should be pretty cool too. So yeah, I and mean, it's super easy to add different back ends or if you want to add, add different, uh, uh, sending strategies as well. It's really easy. So the actual code for simple send is is really not that long. It's maybe like 15 lines or something. Um, so you can you know add your own functionality if you want, and then call your own function on top of that. Um, so those internal interfaces are exposed. But if you just want to do you know regular sends or or whatever, that's a, yeah a, a pretty good way to get started. But yeah, I, I would look for the next workshop where we're going to cover a bunch of the other tools because we have uh, tooling from everywhere from very low level where you're you know building up transactions, uh, you know generating the op returns yourself and and setting up the outputs and inputs yourself and, and blah 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 all the way up to SLP Lite um, where you know you you're relying on services to sort of hand or, or code to handle a lot of that for you. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of different ways that uh, you can do it. And it sort of depends on your application, right? If, uh, if you're just doing a, an application that doesn't need any of that fancy stuff, uh, you don't, you're not using any smart contracts or anything. Um, yeah. Just go with the simplest thing possible. And, and you know, that's, that's normally a, a safe route to go. So. Yeah, definitely. Like, there's so many ways of creating SLP transactions uh, with our with, with the tooling we have available. You can actually see on the SLP.dev website. This doesn't even call. Uh, this doesn't even include REST API that we have. Um, you know, there's a lot of tools here, like metadata maker, parser. Go to tooling. There's a bunch of tools. GS plus um, plus. This one I'm I'm showing specifically is for if you want to create. Advanced, like if your application has a lot of advanced needs, we have something called SLPJS, and it's basically like a heavy, heavy duty library that performs a lot of functionality. Um, you know, on on um, you know, if you import it on uh, as a node, um, and yeah, I mean, if you look at that, like that, you know, what JT showed you is one way of sending a transaction here. There's another way of sending transaction. You're using SLPJS. It's actually allowing you to configure where the you know where your where your trusted source is. You know, like if you look at it, like there's a bunch of stuff you can you can tie that to balances and tie it to all sorts of things. Um, yes, and then there's like BCHD. There's like uh, REST API. We have REST API where we can we can use REST API to also create transactions and you know so. In the next workshop, we're really gonna we're really gonna dive deep into that, and uh, we don't really have time this workshop to to really dive into. It. We just wanted to sort of kind of show you that actually, like the the way to create transactions, like SLP transactions, 
or any of these like mint or burn transaction SLP is incredibly simple. It's incredibly like easy to grasp. I mean, if you look at this, right, like, you know, just a few lines of code and you can send a transaction, like no small contract, nothing. Just, all it is is just, you know, import, you know, big number and you know, import JS and you know, it connects to something and then there you go. You can actually just, you know, you can you can fly, you can do you can do a token transaction, right? No solidity, nothing, right? It's just you know, yeah. So um yeah, I guess that covers most of it. Is, like um, is there anything here you want to add about um stuff, JT? No, I think I think this is all really good. I think we should open up to questions. Cool. So um, before we go into questions, let's uh, show you one of the coolest uh, features of. Uh, so have you? I hope JP's been collecting your addresses. <laughs> but um, uh, we have. So one of the really cool things. I remember we talked about advantages of SLP, right? Being low fee and being able to do a lot of transactions very fast, right? And one of the things that we can do very easily on SLP is we can actually like target, we can send dividends, we can send rewards to any addresses we want to target. So we can actually target, we do things like if you had X amount of tokens, you would get an airdrop. Or we could reward everyone that has, you know, have like an NFT token or some other token and like drop them stuff right. Um, I'm not exactly going to go into tool the tool for time reasons, but basically on um, so they have something called a dividend tool on on uh, Bitcoin.com. So I'll show you in theory how it would have been done. And basically, we'll do it after the like as the workshop ends and taking questions. So actually, I've actually got here. That's the Spice token ID. So if I want to send Spice to a bunch of people, I can do that. OK, so if I click that, I basically put, OK, so who do I want to re receive this token? So maybe if guys had some of that block pack token, then I can actually put that in. Um, and let's just do that. But you know, I don't think that's been sent out yet. But I can actually just go here. Take a token ID, go back here, and I'm, oh, sorry, <laughs> that was, sorry, that wasn't the, that was a screenshot, okay. And go like, okay, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna drop like, let's say 100,000 spice to all the addresses that I have the block hack token, right? I can go build TX, and then it'll like collect the token information, it's done. Uh, just to jump in quick, I just sent half a Bitcoin cash to everyone who sent their uh, uh, addresses in. So you get some some percentage of that, depending on how many addresses came in. So it's uh, equally distributed um, awesome. from the intro to SLP uh, token. If I send you some of the block hack tokens, you can, you can also drop that, right? <laughs> so... Yeah, I mean, you can go here, you can press pay, uh, pay with SLP. So basically, once you go ahead with this, I can just actually airdrop that. I can airdrop this amount to every address that has your uh, block hack token, right? And you can imagine this working for dividends. You can imagine this working for all sorts of, like, you know, really cool, um, like, use cases. And, you know, James Kramer, the creator of SLP, is also working on a more advanced version of this tool. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, Another thing I want to close up with uh, before we go into questions is that you know I know a lot of you guys are interested in in the in smart contracts on um, SLP, right? So because the workshop might come quite late, if some of people are very technically curious about how you would use so this is a really, really cool project. This was like, I, it was done by some AIM people. I don't know who did it, but they basically, what they did was they merged the minting baton of a smart contract, create a kind of new coin, which you actually needed to use a miner, mining using proof of work, uh, but no difficulty adjustment to create tokens, right? Um, so if you guys are interested in checking how that works, the code's all there and it's explained. 
uh, we will be doing a workshop um, that will explain exactly how the smart contract works. But I know a lot of people are very, very interested in like creating their own like smart contract tokens. So I'm just going to pop that in into the uh, um, crowdcast. You know, if you are interested in how that tech works, and that's an example of that. We can we can actually do smart contracts on SLP. It's just that by default, you don't. Like if you want a simple token, you don't need to use smart contracts. But if you want to have smart contract capabilities, you can do that with NFTs. You can do that with a minting baton and a bunch of other things. Um, so yeah, if you're just you're just raring to go into you're raring to go into the advanced functionality of SLP because uh, you want to do more advanced. You know, you want to do more advanced functionality in your project. Then you know, take a look at this. And how this is uh, voted. Um, so that concludes um, everything. I think the last one we have is we just want to run through. Um, this is I. I don't know. I don't know. I think we lost a thing, JT. We did. We we finished it. This, this didn't. We? But don't miss our next workshop. We're gonna do a overview. Of, we're, we're right now. We're just gonna do a light overview of the ways you can develop on SLP. So if you're familiar with the normal uh, mean stack like the normal thing to teach you boot camps or JavaScript web dev, then REST API is there. We have REST API on Bitcoin.com, full stack of cash. Um, you can use REST API to do almost everything on uh, um, SLP. Now, there are pros and cons to using that solution, and we'll go into that uh, next workshop. We have a really cool solution where you can spin your own node up very quickly, like BCH nodes spin up very quickly, and there's a uh, New uh, protobuf protocol that and gRPC that James Kramer has built on top of that as a uh, interface, a, a wrapper on top of BCHD that allows you to interface directly with uh, the SLP index. Which BCHD now recently just implemented a thing where it automatically indexes all SLP transactions. So the that almost like the more futuristic version of SLP where we no longer need the SLP DE. We just actually can get a lot of the transactions from BCHD. So very excited to cover that. And then SLPJS, which we talked about a little bit, like the advanced tool that has a ton of capability, heavyweight JavaScript library. And we have about like seven, eight, nine different island tools that allow you to debug, to put metadata, to uh, you know, construct you know, transactions and do all sorts of really cool things um, on, you know, on uh, and test applications on um, uh, SLP. So the island tool, SLP JS, you know, if you're even more adventurous, you could actually take a lot of these individual tools, tools we have and just piece your project together. And we'll cover we'll cover how each of these are good depending on the type of projects project you're doing, right? So if your project is like a game, you know. Probably maybe REST API is the best solution. You know, you might not want to go as far as having to use SLPJS. If you want to do an exchange, spinning up your own node um, that might be the best solution because you want to have your own node to make sure you verify everything, right? And, and BHD is very fast and you know returns very fast, and you need that for an exchange. Um, so yeah, that that could be on the next workshop, and I uh, really look look forward to. To uh, go into that, like for this one, I won't really go into in depth in, in depth into it. And on the other, the next work, I will also have other people uh, which will dive deeper um, into uh, the tool, the tool in uh, SLP. So I think that's done, and um, I'm we're open for questions. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Joey and JT, for that awesome presentation. It's always blowing my mind, like how far we've come, but you know, still how much how much more there is to discover in this space, and all these things that uh, we said weren't going to be possible on Bitcoin are now possible through Bitcoin Cash, like uh, you know, smart contracts, NFTs, like these these tokenization of, of things that 
were not possible are now becoming a, a reality. So that's super cool. Uh, I've been learning a ton through these workshops and there's more to come. I know you guys have an, uh, a, a workshop specifically on NFTs coming up. I'm definitely looking forward to that. NFTs are taking uh, the, the blockchain space by storm. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a super exciting time. So yeah, we're gonna open it up to questions. If anybody has uh, more questions, please drop them down in the box there. Um, let's take a look in on our polls. I'm curious. Uh, so it was we ended it with a 50-50 split. So we're undecided. That means we do nothing. Um, we're not gonna find <laughs> out. Uh, we're not gonna uh, find know, out. That link leads to nowhere. I bet you that link actually just goes nowhere. But I, yeah. I, I'm not. I'm not gonna click on it. I can't it, be bothered. It's, it's Schrodinger's <laughs> link. It, it's Schrodinger's <laughs> link. <laughs> we don't know. I think I have yeah. to link it. Um, I wanted to add for Bitcoin Cash that we're, you know, top of the functionality, you know, you were talking about the uh, the nodes are also, you know, in, in deep discussion of making like some upgrades, right? So we are not only are we we look we already have like the capabilities to Oracle and stuff like that, we're we're actually really gonna increase like some of these uh, transaction limits, um, unconfirmed TX, we're gonna basically bump it up so you'd be able to do like like even more stuff on Bitcoin Cash. Um, in the coming and the coming few months, so you know, definitely like that. the capability of what we're talking about is just going to expand. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm super excited to see what comes out of uh, out of these projects here. Um, so I got a personal question uh, to ask you guys: uh, What made you want to come in and hang out with us and build during Block Hack, and what are you looking to get out of it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just that I, you know, I think the big thing is that I just all, we just all wanted to, the SLP Foundation, we wanted to take Bitcoin Cash and really present that to the outside world. Because I think Bitcoin Cash has this thing where it does everything itself, and it doesn't really, really put itself out there in terms of the wider uh, ecosystem. And that's what I thought was really attractive about the Block Hack, was that you guys were really about bringing together you know, I mean, everyone here is on the same mission, right? We're all very excited about the same descent. You know, the future of technology is decentralized, obviously, and we're all excited about this. I love, I love Ethereum. You know, I love Polkadot. You know, I love all these other technologies. It's a, it's a free market. There's a lot of interesting things coming up on different blockchains, and different blockchains do different things better. You know, for different things. Um, so, I just really like the mission of you know trying to get everyone together and realize that we're all basically behind the same ideals, really, at the end of the day. And um, also, like, just really getting Bitcoin Cash and just kind of going, we're not, like, in a silo. Like, you know, actually, a lot of our stuff is, a lot of our values, a lot of our tech is actually compatible to what, compatible for what other people are building out there, whether that's business, whether that's blockchain, you know. So, definitely, yeah. That's awesome. And um, I heard you're looking, you're looking for devs. You, you want uh, more devs to join your team. So tell us a little bit about like, what, what you guys have, um, have going on there. Yeah, so we're, I mean, we're kind of like starting. Um, we're starting, so we'll be looking at devs. We, we're looking for devs to like, work on stuff at the SLP Foundation, you know, help with the infrastructure. And if there's a really cool project on research, we'll put it under our R&D program. Uh, like a uh, post office protocol is an example that it was a really great idea and we took that on board and we funded it and it's like almost kind of like getting there you know that's the thing we're telling you about where you can send an slp transaction and not pay any gas uh so yeah we're, we're we're looking we're looking to hire people and uh yeah definitely definitely i'm on the lookout for for devs and it doesn't even need to be devs we need copywriters we need marketing we need all sorts of things so uh yeah definitely Sweet. So you guys, you guys heard it here. If you're looking for work, if you're looking to go full time crypto and and get paid to build the the bleeding edge of technology, um, you know, it starts here. It starts with you know building a project or during this hackathon and you know getting in front of um, in, in front of the SLP Foundation and then taking it further. Um, so that is an amazing opportunity there. I highly suggest you all take advantage of. Um, okay, so unless there are any more last-minute questions, I think we're about to wrap it up. 
Um, so on that note, I want to thank JT and Joey again for being here. An amazing workshop. And this isn't the last we, we're going to see of you. We got a couple more workshops coming up down the line. So if, um, if you guys haven't heard uh, or, or um, if you haven't joined the, um, our Crowdcast, I know, actually, I wanted to give a shout out to Yoshi because I've seen in the chat he, um, he's been recasting this on his Twitch channel. And um, so I think a bunch of folks came came across from that Twitch channel. So I want to give a shout out to Yoshi and, and all of his followers. So if you're finding out about this, um, you know, through through Yoshi's channel, um, and maybe you didn't know about uh, the hackathon already, I'd like to welcome you guys to the cast. And um, I want to direct you guys to check out our, um, you know, our webpage, blockhack.ca, sign up for the hackathon. It's not too late, although we will be shutting down um, registration soon. So make sure you sign up and then get into our, uh, our Discord. And we got, your, we got your back there. If you have any questions, you need help with your projects, you'll find us there. Uh, we also have a, a portal that you can, um, you can join and, and find out some educational information there. So yeah, huge shout out to, to Yoshi there. And so, I'd like to thank everybody that joined it on the stream. We will see you uh, on Wednesday. We have some more workshops and, and talks um, lined up for you. But until then, I will see you guys on the next stream. Thanks a lot, thank Joey. You. Thanks a lot, JT. Take care, guys. Thank you. Yeah, bye. Bye. It's always the leave button, right? Where is the...